Good evening and welcome to tonight's Board of Commissioners meeting. I'm grateful that we have Reverend Kristen Lee here with us tonight from East Cobb United Methodist Church. She will be providing our invocation, which will be followed by the pledge, which will be brought by Deputy Megan Rittenauer Bailey. For those of you willing and able, please rise for our invocation and pledge. Good evening, Board of Commissioners and guests. I invite you to join with me in a moment of prayer. Oh God, we give thanks for this evening. We give you thanks for the rain that comes down around us tonight, nourishing the earth that so desperately needs it. I offer prayers this evening for the Board of Commissioners meeting. Lord, I pray that there will be a spirit of hope, a spirit of visioning and dreaming, a spirit of joy, a spirit of community. In all the presentations that are made, Lord, I pray, pray that there are ears to hear, that there are eyes to see, and hearts willing to accept whatever decisions are made. God, that they will be all for the good of our community here in Cobb County. All this I pray in your son's glorious name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our meeting is now called to order. <clears throat> we have two presentations this evening. The first will be brought by District 1 Commissioner Kelly Gambrell. And if I could have Dr. Farrar come up, please. Look at that. <laughs> Good evening. It is with great pleasure um, that the Cobb County Board of Commissioners present to you the Certificate of Achievement. Uh, Dr. Bill Farr, the Cobb County Board of Commissioners congratulates you on winning the gold medal in the table tennis at the 2022 National Senior Games hosted by the National Senior Games Association. We applaud your competitive spirit and showcase of skills in the 20 sport biennial competition for men and women over 50. Thank you for representing Cobb County and Georgia on the national stage. This is the 28th day of June, 2022. We need your picture, sir. Thank you, Commissioner, and congratulations on that award. Um, our next presentation will be to honor our Chief Judge of Magistrate Court and his team for their work with the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Yeah. Commissioners, please feel free to join me from here while we provide the award. And anyone from our team, County Manager, I know you've been very involved too, if you'd like to join us. And I don't know if Debbie's here. This could be the Better Late Than Never Award, as this award was provided to our judge back in April 2022 as part of our 
annual ACCG conference, which is the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia. Each year we get opportunity to put forward applications of county achievements and efforts that we think are worthy of recognition. And certainly the effort by um, Judge Brendan Murphy, his team, our county staff, commissioners, and so many of our community partners, including our five nonprofits that have been involved in this effort, have helped so many families here in Cobb, I believe about 3,000 families, be able to keep a roof over their head through rental assistance. And not only have they been recognized nationally, but they've also been recognized at home. And wanted to make sure that you got this. It's a beautiful award. And I'm sure you can add this to the many that you've received. How, count, how many have you received now? We're building a trophy case, but it's not in the budget. <laughs> it's not in the budget. You're good. Very good. Yes. but. Congratulations, we are very grateful to honor you and just appreciate your vision and your thoughtfulness towards our vulnerable citizens at a time where you're really a moderator between the landlord and tenant, right? But being able to bring people together is what made this happen. So just congratulations and thank you for helping us help Cobb County. Good evening, I know y'all have an agenda, but I did want to introduce, usually I come and I bring greetings on behalf of the People's Court. Today I decided to bring the People's Court. So I did just want to introduce our team. One of our rental assistance clerks, uh, Liliana, is here. And so thank you, Liliana. We've got Judge Quinn Casper, our court support manager, Betsy Manston, our clerk of court, Ann Gordon, our court administrator, Tanisha Phillips, Judge Jennifer Inman, Judge Rita Cherry, the Dean of the Court, Judge Mike McLaughlin, and then our newest Superior Court judge, she'll be leaving the People's Court soon, Judge Sonia Brown. So, I wanted to thank our team because they're the ones that make uh, rental assistance a reality for the tenants and landlords of our community every single day. I wanna thank Dr. McMorris for encouraging us to apply on behalf of the county, and then certainly to the Chairwoman and the Board of Commissioners because it's your initiative, your funding that has made this a reality for our community the entire time. Um, our county was one of the first to pursue this and we're still doing it and we're doing it well. So thank you all for that. Thank you, very good, thank you. Please stand in the middle with the team and we'll take a nice photo. Okay, this takes us to our public hearing portion of the meeting. We have one matter, which is to have a second public hearing regarding the initial draft of our 2040 comprehensive plan. And I'll turn things over to our director, Jessica Gwynn. Hello, good evening, Jessica Gwynn, Cobb County Community Development. As you know, over the last several months, we've been working on the five-year update to the 2040 comprehensive plan. At this point, we do have a draft document that has been forwarded to you all. I hope that you'll take some time to take a peek at it and provide us with some comments and feedback. And we had a great discussion yesterday with Commissioner Gambrell, and we'll be reaching out to each of you in your offices to set up a time that we can go over that with you all. Um, tonight, we have with us Phil Westbrook, who is our senior planner, and he's been our project manager on this effort. So he's gonna do a brief presentation just to update you kind of on where we are. 
um, the public input that we've received to this point as well as the next steps moving forward as we move forward to the completion and the adoption of the comprehensive plan in October. And at that point, we would just ask that the chair open the public hearing and certainly glad to answer any questions you all might have. All right, all right Phil. All right, thanks, Jessica. Oh boy, here we go. This has been a long progress, a long process, but uh, uh, we're we're getting close. And um, thank you for this opportunity to stand up here and give you a brief uh, uh, overview of where we stand with our five-year update and where we're headed, as long as well as notifying the community that uh, we will be having a draft available for for public review uh, beginning tomorrow. So. Uh, just a little bit of background. Um, the conference planning activities is mandated uh, for Cobb County uh, via the Georgia Planning Act of 1989. Uh, the rules of the local, local comprehensive planning are part of the Department of Community Affairs standards and procedures of local comprehensive planning through that act. And the Department of Community Affairs does require certain uh, elements to be updated every five years, which brings us to where we are today. Um, our last update was 2017, and obviously five years um, has passed, and we are here to update part of the comprehensive plan. And this is to extend our qualified local government status, which will help us um, uh, continue to for that potential access to um, state and federal funds, and, as well as grants. So some of the progress that we've made um, we have, from the beginning, a little over a year ago, we uh, started the development of the framework plan, which uh, pretty much guide, guided us through the planning process. At the beginning of the project, uh, we went through a lot of pre-planning, uh, data gathering, and analysis to uh, get a sense of where we are in Cobb County as far as demographics and, and socioeconomics. Uh, we also conducted our first public hearing on October 12th of last fall, 2021. Uh, this was just to let the uh, community know that we were going through this process and also giving them uh, dates and, and times that they, how they could get involved in the process. Uh, we then began our community engagement campaign and then combing through all the comments and the feedback that we received through that engagement, uh, we created this draft. It's really an updated uh, version of our 2017 uh, comp plan. And again, uh, we're here tonight to uh, sort of unveil that for, for public review. The focus um, for this five-year update pretty much focused on the needs and whether those current needs are still relevant today. Uh, we also identified our, our focused on identifying any land use changes uh, and small area policy guidelines that could uh, potentially um, uh, change. Uh, we also focused on the transportation element, uh, really uh, based on the rules, as you know, um, the recently adopted comprehensive transportation plan, uh, DCA does allow us to integrate that plan into our comprehensive plan. So there wasn't really a big focus on our part um, from the transportation element, uh, other than integrating that plan into our comprehensive plan. And then uh, one of the new rules that we have is, uh, believe it or not, all communities have to have a broadband element. So we did include a broadband element and there was a focus on that, as well as the report of accomplishments and the community work program. So the community engagement phase of this project, I'll tell you, it was a little challenging at the first. Uh, if you remember, we started this back in January and that was in the middle of the COVID pandemic, at least sort of the I don't know if there's an end to it, but kind of on the back end of, of when things were really rough. Um, so we had to accommodate different formats, and I, I feel like we did a great job. Once we had a path forward, uh, we had, uh, once we had the tools that we decided that we were going to move forward with, uh, the implementation of that engagement process, I, I feel like, was extremely fulfilling and rewarding. Uh, based on the participation and the feedback uh, we received. Uh, we, there were really two components to our community engagement phase. There was the face-to-face -face interaction, and we're not talking like literally physically face-to-face. -face. This was live, whether it be virtual or in person, this was live face-to-face -face, um, interaction we had. We carried out 15 stakeholder interviews, 
10 community meetings slash workshops um, and open houses. Uh, those 10, that included four virtual workshops, one in-person workshop, and then the five open house meetings. Uh, we had a little over 250 uh, participants that participated in those face-to-face -face interactions. And I can tell you that um, we had a tremendous amount of content and, and, and feedback from those 250 participants. Then probably our most successful part of community engagement was our dinner, digital interaction. This was uh, where um, we included an interactive information online feedback plat platforms uh, where we created uh, or allowed the community to participate online from anywhere uh, at any time. And one of our primary or our, our highlights of this digital participation was our engagement portal. This is um, pretty top, top of the line. Um, we use some of our GIS, ESRI um, software and, and our uh, internet, I guess, so to speak, without a lack of a better term, uh, to create an engagement portal that actually included all the education, information, and participation uh, that you could think of um, through this process. For instance, the future land use plan, that was basically an educational part as part of the engagement portal that allowed folks to go in and learn about the future land use, what it means, the definitions, the density ranges, the, uh, the compatible zonings. Uh, and then there was also in that engagement par uh, portal was a survey. Uh, the survey was mainly for uh, identifying whether the current needs are, are still relevant today. And then our community in input application, this was a mapping uh, software that allowed for anyone to come in and pinpoint, put a pin down on, on a location in the county and make a comment. And then we could actually see that comment. Not only that, but others, others in the community could come back behind them and take a look at that comment and like it or even make their own comment. They could even potentially add pictures and images if, if, if they wanted to sort of give an example of what they were looking for. So. Um, and as you can see, we had tremendous amount of views. Uh, those are just the views that we've had. And I can tell you that uh, with all of this uh, community engagement participation, again, thousands of views and comments, and I would dare to guess we had anywhere between three to 4,000 different comments. Um, I wouldn't say different. They, different people have commented, but a lot of um, similarities in, in the comments. So, and uh, reviewing all the comments and comparing them to our existing plan, I can tell you that there hasn't really been a lot of change in the last five years. Uh, the sentiment in the community is still growth management policies, uh, the preservation of the existing character of the neighborhoods, and the promotion of redevelopment in areas where the infrastructure is in place. Housing strategies continue to be a mix of housing types as well as housing that is attainable at, at all income levels. The community is still, would still like to see more parkland. And that's both passive and active. And one of the new, one of the new uh, uh, topics that seemed to rise to the front, and I think this had to do with a lot of the, the past parks bond, a lot of the new parkland that have master plans, uh, they want to see those master plans developed out. Uh, so uh, that was one of the new uh, aspects to this. Um, lack of broadband service was not really a concern with the, with the, um, with the community. And of course, our data reflected that. Um, however, uh, the affordability and reliability of broadband was uh, some, some issues that we heard about. Uh, Placemaking and creating a vibrant community uh, was another need uh, that warranted strategies around creating a sense of place, providing connectivity, and a, a sort of a healthy, active living environment. So with all that information we gained through the process, the project management team ended up making uh, some minor modifications to the needs, goals, and policies. The team also provided potential uh, land use amendments and small area policy guidelines that were brought forward through this community engagement process. Uh, we did add a broadband element, uh, complete with needs, goals, and policies. Uh, and then um, we 
uh, updated the report of accomplishments uh, from our projects the last five years and created a new community work program that will take us out another five years. All of this information will be uh, within our comprehensive plan that will be for public review uh, beginning tomorrow. And then of course we conducted general edits to the plan and looked for ways to sort of streamline the document to make it easier uh, to use and reference. And uh, this is kind of gives you an outline of what the document actually looks like. Um, we have a main document that includes all the different elements and their goals and policies, and then we have six appendices uh, that, that supplement that main document. The, uh, the appendix one, that's probably going to be the most useful one um, out of the appendices. Uh, that's our future land use plan. That is the guideline for future development. That is the document that you guys use a lot for uh, zoning and, and so forth and rezoning cases. And, and uh, th that, that will contain the small area, the land use guidelines and the small area policy guidelines. Uh, that last bullet down at the bottom, that is not part of the, um, I guess it's not a permanent fixture on the comp plan. If you got, you, you're used to the annual updates that we do on our land use plan, that is what the comprehensive plan amendment package is. That, those are the proposed land use changes and small area policy guideline changes that uh, have been incorporated into this update. Um, once we adopt this plan, uh, those, those uh, proposals will be incorporated into the future land use plan based on any changes that occur through the, the adoption process. And then moving forward, uh, again, um, tonight, uh, notifying the community that a draft plan is available. Uh, we'll get that up online tomorrow. Uh, we will be looking to come back in, on August 9th to authorize submittal to ARC, who will then submit it to DCA for uh, review on a more of a, making sure that we follow the, the standards and rules of, of the procedures of the Georgia Planning Act. And then uh, we will come back uh, in uh, September, October timeframe and, and look for seeking adoption and making sure that we uh, can uh, get it ad adopted by uh, our deadline on October 31st. And just uh, our last slide here, um, any more information, um, the actual document itself will be at this website, www.cobbcounty.org forward slash comp dash plan. And there is an email address. That email address will also be uh, on that link. Uh, so if anyone has any questions and want to provide comments based on the uh, plan, uh, we, um, that is there. And also we will accommodate any uh, hard copy request. Uh, we just ask that you give us a couple of days for that process, for us to process that. So. Um, that is it, and um, so now we can open it up. Yeah, just real quick before we open up the public hearing, and thank you, Phil. A big shout out to Phil and his team and the planning group. You know, a lot of local governments, counties, cities contract us out. They hire a consultant or they contract it out to the, to the regional commission, and this is something our staff has done all in-house. Um, it's a heavy lift. Uh, this is just a five-year update, so it's not quite what we'll be doing in another five years when we come back to do the full update, but it's still it's a lot of work. So I really appreciate Phil's effort. Um, I was thinking as he was talking about the public engagement efforts, um, we've come a long way since I worked on my first comprehensive plan, just the resources that are available to provide opportunities for people to participate virtually, uh, to participate when they have time to participate versus coming to six or seven public meetings, it's really remarkable the resources that we have available and I think that we were able to collect a lot of good, meaningful public feedback because of that. Um, but this is certainly not the last opportunity for the public to be involved. Of course, we have the 30-day review period here where the plan document is going to be available for everyone to take a look at. We'll also have an additional public hearing whenever it's time to adopt the plan. So uh, again, thank you to the Board of Commissioners for your time. I think at this point we've met with all of you probably at least twice and looking forward to continuing those discussions. But also a big thank you to all of our other departments that have provided good feedback into our plan update. And it's you know an effort that truly we have to reach out to every single department to find, about, find out about the things that they're working on, whether it's transportation or sanitation or libraries and what have you. So a big thank you to all of those departments as well. And at this time, again, we just ask that the chair open the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Philip. You guys did an outstanding job with this effort. With that, we have a public hearing which will allow members of the public to provide feedback on this matter alone. 
again, it's regarding the comprehensive plan. You'll have up to three minutes to provide feedback. And with that, I'll go ahead and declare the public hearing open. If you have any remarks on Friday, yes, sir, please approach for three minutes. I'm just going to make a quick comment. Yes, if, we know who you are, but for the Leroy Emkin, live in Marietta. I want to thank this committee. Whether I agree or disagree with the results of your efforts, you've done an outstanding job. They did an outstanding job, and a comment was made, without the need to hire an external consultant, paid for by our tax dollars. Millions of dollars of tax dollars were not used to pay them as an external consultant to develop this report. These people had the experience, the qualifications to do this kind of work within Cobb County. Cobb County employees have all the necessary qualifications to do something as complex as this, to interact with the public, with the taxpayers, without hiring an outside consultant. I thank you for that. That's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. Are there any other comments? Yes. Okay. Good evening. I'm Jan Barton. I had a PowerPoint to present, but unfortunately it's lost somewhere between, between here and there. I didn't realize we couldn't get emails here. Um, but I just have a couple of comments. We had to kind of work blindly because the uh, written plan is not available yet. It will be, as was just mentioned. We feel that in looking at this, the priorities are just all messed up. Sorry, I mean, I think you did a good job with the pr priorities that were presented to you. But the um, Atlanta Regional Commission has chosen to make biking, walking, and riding transit the priority for our communities. And that is not our priority. Our priority is to maintain our suburban neighborhoods and our single family low density developments. And we are not looking at doing infilling as we as citizens are not. I'm very concerned that the priorities are misplaced and we need to have better input from the citizens, not the Atlanta Regional Commission. And seeing the number of people who interacted during COVID, I give you that, and I think y'all did a great job reaching out to people with what you had to work with. There were very few people involved. I ask you to consider rearranging your priorities. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have our next speaker. Good evening. I'm Pamela Reardon. I live in East Cobb. Um, I was happy to see that he went through the summaries of what the people um, had in their interactions and their surveys. But I was going to highlight um, a few of these in that um, people, I think, don't understand the problem with stormwater because it hardly showed up on the surveys, which I wanted to point out as, um, I mean, I guess if you don't live it, you don't understand it. So another one was um, people wanted, 70% wanted to focus on redevelopment of existing properties and not develop properties that are pristine and left like maybe what we'd call rural or not developed. And that over 72% wanted to focus on, uh, like what Jan had mentioned, single family and that the traffic problems, oddly enough, only 40% of the people um, thought that there were any traffic problems, but they were in West Cobb. Um, oddly enough, South Cobb, they were fine. They, it was like maybe 15 to 20%, which I thought was um, a good thing, I guess. Um, the other thing is the mixed use development. Um, there seemed to be more wanted, um, I think 60%, 65%, they wanted that in South Cobb. 
didn't want it in the rest of COP. Um, the, of course, nobody wanted manufacturing. No one wants that. And no one wanted the warehouses, 72%. And people didn't want the um, shopping centers. So people wanted more parks, which was stated. I myself, um, I have a concern with the high to medium density maps that are showing along Johnson Ferry, Shallowford, and Sandy Plains. In particular, the shopping center, um, I think Jamestown owns it, that is currently the Kroger um, and Lower Roswell Road and Johnson Ferry, where oddly enough, I think it's what, uh, item 20, 29 on the agenda, um, they want to redo that intersection, so that's kind of um, odd, uh, and I'll speak about that later. Um, of course, we don't see the uh, codes, and um, there's always been originally um, the wanting to do a UDC, which is a uni unified um, development code. And everyone thinks, oh, that sounds really good because that's going to make our life really easier. Well, it's not the case because you just have to look to Roswell, where they voted everyone out this past year, two years, um, because they brought that in, what, six years ago. So I'm at the end of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Okay, we have another one. Um, good evening, my name's Craig Harfoot, and um, I've sat through a lot of these back to 2005, and it seemed like the only people that are putting in the input, and he didn't make it real transparent who they were, or the developers, like Council for Quality Growth, Mike Parrish, the lobbyist that doesn't identify himself as a lobbyist here. He never did. And um, they've been manipulating our county code for the whole time I've been here. Since, you know, it's when things got really congested and everything else. In the 70s, it, it sort of all came about because they backed Sam Olins, then they backed Tim Lee, and then they backed, I think, Mike Boyce. And I don't know, didn't look up uh, anybody here now, but they're the ones that seem to, they're looking at all these commercial tracks. And then what the difficulties with um, Mount Bethel breaking off from the thing, uh, their conference, and now the court says they got to pay them a ton of money to keep it, what they have already built as a congregation. I'm sure that's a big track that's going to be affected by this stuff and all the little developers and the money guys are all just chomping at the bit. There's not much transparency to the process. And... Uh, the next one might be Johnson's Ferry Baptist, because when there's a downturn, and if you look, Tyler Perry bought up all the churches in the outlying parcels for making movies. I mean, churches can be anything, people. It's just land. But the, um, the one thing I need to say is 800,000 people. We need three to four new board members before you even adopt anything because you're stretched too thin on the board. You each got to represent 200,000 people now. And I, I doubt you have time to even look at the summaries that the staff lays out for you and you just go, yeah, we take them at their word. They went to Leadership Cobb and they must be right. But you can't let Council for Quality Growth and Chop, Cobb Chamber of Commerce dictate what the rest of us have to pay for, because that is taxation without representation. So, you know, and our revolution, 4th of July is coming up. It was over 200 years ago. It's like, it's getting about 250 years now. And um, I just hope you become more responsive and can understand what it is I'm trying to say, because you don't control the interest rates. The banks dropped drop to zero and suddenly you got a windfall, but the bad news is still yet to come. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers, again, with respect to this public hearing?
Uh, thank you very much for letting us speak on this. Uh, my name is Matt Segal. Uh, I've lived here for more than 30 years. Hope to live here for more than 30 more. Um, when it comes to the uh, comprehensive plan, um, I do think that up to this point, our county has grown in a suburban way that's not very sustainable. If we continue to um, grow in that way, uh, there's just not as much available land to continue with um, a lot of the uh, you know, uh, single family neighborhood lots. Uh, I know that some areas of the county are, are good for that, other areas aren't. Uh, if we do expect to grow in the way that we are in the, over the course of the next 20 or 30 years, um, there will be, uh, you know, I know a lot of people think this is a bad word, but there will be density. And um, how we grow in a sustainable way and how we grow in a smart way will be very important. And uh, that ties in the land use and transportation. And I, I do wish that there was a little bit more um, co like coordination or integration between the two because they are so interlinked. And um, I, I do think that as we look at 2040, 2050 and beyond, um, the integration of those two, um, those two issues will be more and more interlinked as um, we put more stresses on the land as well as on our transportation systems as well. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Okay, not seeing any more. The public hearing is now closed. Um, Jessica or Philip, do you have any closing remarks? No, no additional remarks. Yes. Just thank you all again. And again, looking forward to talking with each of you to hear your feedback and comments to this point on the plan and the draft and bringing it back for the Board of Commissioners to transmit it to the ARC later on this year. So thank you again. Thank you. Before you sit down, let me make sure I poll the commissioners to see if they have any questions or comments for our presenters. You did get my notes? Yes. Yes, we did. <laughs> okay. You're good. Commissioners? But thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. This now takes us to the public comment portion of our meeting. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, as the board provides the podium to public comment, it's appropriate to review the related meeting rules. Uh, please state your name and if you're speaking on behalf of an organization, all comments should be addressed through the chair. Public comment is not a dialogue with the board, but an opportunity for speakers to provide their comments to the board. The comments should not be impertinent, derogatory, offensive, or slanderous. To that end, the board encourages, uh, regardless of the topic, for the audience to be respectful and courteous to the speakers. Everyone attending this meeting should give others the right to be both listened to and to be heard by treating each other with civility. Statements made during the public comments portion do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the board or the administration of uh, Cobb government. And just a reminder to the uh, speakers, there is a uh, tracker of your time on uh, the podium. With that being said, the first public speaker is Mr. Lance Laberton. Uh, good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Um, my name is Lance Lamberton. I'm on, here on behalf of the Cobb Taxpayers Association. And rather than I don't, the subject I wanted to talk about is the issue of expanding mass transit in Cobb County. But rather than do it myself, I've got a uh, the former uh, commissioner of the Fayette County Board of Commissioners, Steve Brown, has done an excellent video presentation on this subject, which touches on Gwinnett County as well as Cobb County. He's a lot more articulate and better looking than me, so I'm gonna turn the podium over to him. If you can just run that tape. We have a lot to talk about. The, the regional government assured the public that transit ridership would grow by a whopping 40% in Atlanta from 2000 to 2025. Ridership has actually declined. Peter Rogoff of the Federal Transit Administration stated in 2012, that there was more than $78 billion in deferred maintenance costs for public transit agencies across the nation. Both Gwinnett and Cobb counties had explosive suburban growth with an over-reliance on the interstate highway system. We are not going to tear those counties down and start over. We should not expect billions of dollars of transit infrastructure thrown into the mix to solve the traffic congestion. The 2012 region-wide mass transit TSPLOS vote lost in every county, even the MARTA counties. Citizens were lied to, the transit projects were astronomically expensive, and there was no real benefit to building any of them. 
regional leaders had to admit there was no revenue source identified for operations and maintenance of the costly transit expansion. A leading pro-transit expert, Christopher Leinberger, admitted that the billions of dollars in taxes was about real estate development rather than relieving traffic congestion. The leadership at the state, region, and current MARTA counties have made it clear that the current system is not sustainable and that the state and the entire metro region needs to pay the bills. MARTA needs Gwinnett's money, not their transit riders. Former MARTA General Manager Beverly Scott honestly and accurately described the transit system as, quote, a $6 billion investment operating at 30% of its design capacity, end quote. MARTA is not a good partner for financial accountability. A recent investigative report from Channel 2 Action News questioned MARTA's competence to manage transit construction projects and the agency has been operating for 40 years. We have all heard the lie that millennials want to use transit instead of cars. They were supposed to revitalize the ridership of mass transit. They are now the largest growth segment of the automotive industry. Please tell the truth about mass transit. First, mass transit subsidies are not increasing ridership. Large taxpayer transit subsidies have not reduced traffic congestion. Transit subsidies do not reduce air pollution. Mass transit is not energy efficient. Taxpayer transit subsidies are used to benefit real estate developers. And regrettably, transit-oriented developments do more to displace the poor than help them. We are looking at faulty logic. The MARTA system and the Atlanta streetcar have consistent declining ridership and horrible finances. And the pro-transit lobby keeps telling us the answer is to spend even more money and make it bigger. Gwinnett and Cobb already have a more cost-efficient and well-run bus system than MARTA has now. What is the rationale for merging with MARTA? The most notable transit systems across the country are also losing ridership and lots of money. What's the allure of following a model that is failing everywhere and does not reduce traffic congestion? Seriously, why would Gwinnett and Cobb taxpayers have different expectations? When MARTA and the other major transit systems are consistently losing ridership and constantly asking for more money, what is the incentive to waste billions of local dollars that could be used for significant road improvements? So here's the truth about the March 19 referendum. Over 90% of Gwinnett citizens will pay an extraordinary sum for a service they will not use and will not benefit from. The referendum calls for added taxes till 2057, but the infrastructure will have to be funded in perpetuity. There will be no decrease in traffic congestion and billions of dollars the will be pulled from the local economy. The, ne the next public speaker is Jan Barton. Good evening, I'm Jan Barton. Again, no PowerPoint, I apologize. Um, we had asked the uh, board to please remove items 29 and 34 from today's agenda. If you did so, we thank you. However, more discussions must take place. These two items are evidence that the county is not following proper SPLOS project approved by voters. The Lower Roswell Road project did not include bike paths, multi-use trails, and tearing up perfectly good sidewalks when the voters voted for it in 2011. This project has also passed the timeline required by SPLOST. We ask that these items be revisited and corrected. The county incorrectly declared that they have excess funds in the 2016 SPLOST before projects were completed. Now the county is taking or proposing to take more money from the general fund to complete a precinct, a police precinct. What you need to do is fix the error of your ways with these so-called excess funds, which cannot be declared until all projects are finished. 
The Atlanta Regional Commission is a danger to local control. They are making us do things we do not want to do. That is really a Soviet form of government, and it's not local representation. The priorities are not the citizens' priorities. The majority of the community is strongly opposed to the Lower Roswell Road project. We did not approve the bike paths, multi-use trails, replacement of perfectly good sidewalks. These articles did not appear until the 2018 Greenways planned, and then they were listed as proposed without funding, identified which further proves my point. The project will be a bottleneck and negatively impact small businesses and worsen traffic, not only during the two-year construction period, but forevermore. And mixing cyclists with over 20,000 cars on Lower Roswell Road, that was as of the 2015 study, it's much more now, is dangerous, extremely dangerous. That's why you don't see cyclists at that corner right now. The Greenways plan, was introduced in 2018, and that's where more bikes and trails were pushed. We do not want the ideal communist city, which failed in the former Soviet Union, no multi-use, dense development by archaic railroad tracks, please. The comprehensive plan seems to be heading that direction, and we say no. The priorities in the comprehensive plan now underway must change. The pri priorities should not be bike trails, multi-use trails, mixed-use development, intense development, no. We want low taxes, good schools, and a good infrastructure that by now really needs some replacements done. That's, those are the priorities. Please go a different direction, please. Thank you. The next public speaker is Debbie Fisher. Good evening, I'm Debbie Fisher from East Cobb. I'm going to speak on a couple of issues that I heard today in the work session that were kind of disturbing to me. I may have misconceptions on what was actually presented because in all honesty, I haven't done my normal due diligence. For those of you who have been on the board a while, you know how I used to go through the budget with a fine tooth comb. And what I heard today was quite puzzling. I used to go after Chairman Boyce year after year for his 3% merit increase. Coming from corporate America, to us in corporate America, a merit increase was just that. It was based on merit. For those who excel, you could maybe get up to 6%. For those who don't show up on time, who don't do their job, you get zero. But it appears in this budget the board is putting forward what I would call a COLA, not a merit. You're giving them a 3% increase across the board, which, no, <laughs> which does affect additional monies. And I think um, both Commissioner Gambrell and Commissioner Burrell brought them up, and that is the pension plan. On top of that 3% merit increase, if I'm understanding correctly, we're going to have salary increases as well. To me, that makes no sense. Cost of living raise, maybe, but a merit increase should be based on merit. And from dealing with most of every department in Cobb County, I can tell you, you have some stellar employees, but you also have some that are really poor. I would not give them, Z I, w I wouldn't give them anything, actually. The other thing that was um, interesting was your disparity study. And Leroy Income mentioned having all these outside consultants do all these studies. I don't know what that study's going to cost you, but I agree with Commissioner Gambrell and Commissioner Burrell. 
If you already have that data that's available that should give you a wide spectrum of the number of businesses in Cobb who care enough to apply for Keep It In Cobb, why are we paying someone to do this study? Why are we picking out segments of society on who we're going to help versus others we don't? I don't think that's the job of the county commission to decide who are winners and who are losers. In addition to those things, I will say that your overall budget was, to me, totally astonishing. The amount of money you're asking for the amount of tax digest increases that we're having. And I kind of think that moving the parks bond, which actually, if I'm not mistaken, should have been retired in 2018. We could have, because we had the money to do it. We chose not to. We chose to keep it going. Now what are you doing? You're putting it in the fire fund, and yet you're not declaring that an increase? Well. A fund that is supposed to be retired and you keeping it is a tax increase. And you don't have to explain to me how a tax increase is not being had because you're not raising the millage. Yes, you are. You're raising the millage of the fire fund. And I ask you not to do that. I think that is, um, to most people, going to be lost on them. That the parks bond was always intended to go away. And um, I'm going to look forward to a couple of the town hall meetings on the budget, and I promise you all have done my research by then. I thank you for all the work that goes into it with the employees. I know it's not easy, but I think we're on an out-of-control spending train that needs to really be at least slowed down. I congratulate you for putting money in the capital budget. I've been asking for that for years, so thank you. But I also ask you to be responsible with these salary increases. And if we're raising the minimum to $17, I'm going to ask you one other favor. In working through the last several elections, I've gotten to know a lot of Ms. election Fisher. workers. Ms. Fisher. My time is up, darn it. I'm sorry. You're a spoil sport. Mr. Emkin. Leroy Umpkin, live in Marietta. Difficult to follow a presentation like what Debbie just made. <clears throat> I'd like to refer back to the comments made by Jan Barton with respect to the Lower Roswell project to build medians on Lower Roswell Road and to incorporate bicycle paths. I'd like you to imagine Lower Roswell Road just think of it as a verti vertical, north-south, and then Lower Roswell Road, east and west. If you will put this up, please. <clears throat> oh, I, th I thought I made the font large enough to see. It must be difficult. So I'll read this. In 2015, and I have a great deal of respect for the Cobb DOT. I think they do a wonderful job for Cobb County. In 2015, the Cobb DOT, Department of Transportation, reported that traffic volumes on Johnson Ferry Road were around 40,000 vehicles per day. 40,000 vehicles per day. And along Lower Roswell Road, at the intersection between Lower Roswell Road and Johnson Ferry Road, there were around 20,000 vehicles per day traffic volumes. And traffic volumes today have grown, today have grown to around 45,000 vehicles per day and around 25,000 vehicles per day. Can you imagine? the massive traffic that goes on in Lower Roswell Road and Johnson Ferry Road at that intersection. It is now being proposed that bicycle lanes be added on Lower Roswell Road on the east and west sides of Johnson Ferry Road. Can you imagine riding a bicycle 
in traffic volumes on Lower Roswell Road of around 25,000 vehicles per day, having to cross Johnson Ferry Road where the traffic volumes are at 45,000 vehicles per day, and you're on a two-wheel bicycle? Who in his right mind would do that? Where's the common sense of encouraging bicycle ridings on roads with such massive vehicle traffic? How, questions. How do bicycles on Lower Roswell Road, approaching Johnson Ferry Road, safely turn onto Johnson Ferry Road, going north or south? If you're on Roswell Road, Lower Roswell Road, on a bicycle, how are you going, in a bicycle lane, how are you going to make a right turn onto Johnson Ferry Road or a left turn onto Johnson Ferry Road with this massive traffic volume? How does a bicyclist on Lower Roswell Road safely cross over Johnson Ferry Road in order to join the bicycle lane on Lower Roswell Road on the other side of Johnson Ferry Road while motor vehicle traffic is also turning onto Johnson Ferry Road? Could you imagine you're riding a bicycle on Lower Roswell Road and you want to cross over Johnson Ferry Road at the same time that traffic on Lower Roswell Road with the green light is also making left and right turns onto Johnson Ferry Road. What are you as a bicyclist going to do to avoid an accident, to avoid a fatality? Third point, does a bicyclist have the right to travel as a car or truck or bus on other vehicles traveling in the motor vehicle lanes while crossing over Johnson Ferry Road? Would you believe there are federal regulations that say a bicycle has the same right as a car or a truck or a bus? I know some of the people that put these regulations into place. I retired from Georgia Tech civil engineering after 44 years. I know who these people are as transportation engineers. Does this make any sense to you? Where's the common sense? With, with bicycle lanes in this high volume traffic area, Lower Roswell Road, East West, Johnson Ferry Road, North South, bicycles in bicycle lanes, could you imagine the accidents that we're going to have in the future? The fatalities? Mr. Impkin, sorry, your time is up. I cannot imagine that. The next public speaker is Ms. Reardon. Hello, <laughs> again, Ms. Reardon. Okay, so I don't think I can follow that, uh, Leroy. <laughs> um, I'm a cyclist and there's no way you'd catch me riding down either um, the, on the road part of Lower Roswell Road or Johnson Ferry. I would be on the sidewalk going down Johnson Ferry down to the river. But you know what I do? I put my bike in my car and I ride my car to Silver Comet and then, or to another bike path, and then I use that. That's just what I'm gonna say about that. Um, and, I, and I go past that intersection, I don't even know, maybe five times a day. I have never seen a traffic accident there. I'm just saying, I've never seen one. So, and I've lived in East Cobb since 90, uh, 99. So that's um, a lot. Um, we had to live through the widening and the traffic problem is going down Johnson Ferry. So I don't really want to live through another two years or maybe three years of more traffic bottleneck right there. But actually, I was really going to concentrate on the fact that um, the budget and um, why we have inflation. I, I, don't, I think that we are reacting, and I'm afraid that there's going to be too much of a knee-jerk reaction to where we are now. Where we are now is brought about by a, almost two years of administration that has reversed every good policy, every good um, um, getting rid of all the, uh, the um, oppressive uh, regulations on businesses and taking away the oil, 
taking away everything that would make, we were um, self-sufficient in oil. And that has driven up the inflation because that is 50% or more of the cost. So um, we also had COVID, of course, and then we had the COVID welfare. You, th this problem that you have with the workforce is not unique here. It's everywhere. It's because people are taking COVID welfare and they don't want to work. So um, please ask your person in power in Washington to get rid of the COVID welfare and then maybe people will go back to work. Um, that is just a little bit of an inflation. I can go on and on and on about why we have inflation. You're not going to fix it by throwing more money at it. That is the cause of our inflation. We printed money federally. We threw money at the problem last year and the year before. That is not the way to solve it. We have to buckle down because we are going to have, we are in for more let me tell you, more devastation than you can imagine. Our markets are going to crash. Our real estate is going to crash. You are not going to have that digest that you have now. So people are going to be hurting even more than they are now. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. I just know when I look at the in, uh, economic indicators. Last thing I want to talk about, this abusive use of our taxpayer money at the libraries right now with the drag queen the story hours that are going on or whatever they're doing. I, I, you know, I have a lot of gay friends. I love them. I love them to death. Uh, last three years ago, four years ago, my husband and I went down to South Florida. We went to, for entertainment, we went to a drag queen bar. Okay, that's adult entertainment. That is not meant to groom our children. The, it, it is so sexually revulsive to to think of our children watching those episodes, I mean, it just breaks my heart where it's going. Um, I don't understand at times what's happening to this country. I don't understand the attack on our children. CRT, yes it is in the schools. I just don't understand what's going on. Then I step back and I go, you know, this is like an abusive relationship. I really do think that the whole idea is to control us and um, it's just like put yourself in an abusive relationship where the person with the power is abusing you. I feel like that's what's happening now. I, th I feel like this is what's happening in our country. We're being abused by the people in power just to make us um, do what they want us to do and not have any of our own personal freedoms, and it's all for control. So I just, I, I really want to stop the drag queen in our libraries we are funding that with taxpayers' money, and, and that just, it, it sends me over the top with how um, furious it makes me. So I just implore you, you can do it. Stop it. It's not good for our children. Thank you. For a second. Yeah. Ms. Rosman is the next public speaker. Hi, Christine Rosman. I'm in the city of Marietta, and thank you all for speaking. <laughs> I'm stunned. I truly am stunned. And actually, I was stunned, too, that we come up, we prepare, we talk to you all. Lance had a good, very good presentation, and you're all like not even listening. I don't know if all of you weren't listening. Maybe you were writing notes, but I don't think that you were. We're the citizens. You are public servants. You've chose to be public servants. I chose to be in, you know, sales and marketing kind of person. I didn't choose to work for the government, but as government workers, we're paying for all of this. And the fact that you all are just kind of like, not all of you, please, but a little bit smug on the way in which you spend our money is really kind of stunning. I met an, a lady last week, very nice lady, and she said, yeah, I'm gonna have to move. I can no longer afford to live in Cobb County because my taxes are going up. And I can't, I can't let, and so you have all of this, and then you have this spending spree that y'all are on 
with the diversity, equity, inclusion person, it's gonna be like a $150,000 job. And then that person's gonna have an assistant, they're gonna to have to have their pension, they're gonna to have to, so that ends up being like a, what, half a million dollar, you know, job, and that we're gonna be paying for. Um, it, 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 this stuff is not even, it, it's very disconnected from what we in Cobb County want. But you're obviously very transparent about how much the ARC tells you what to do, because you're just doing their bidding. You're, you're just doing whatever they kind of tell you to do, it, it appears, because their priorities have become your priorities. We are your priority. We're not peasants. We are not peasants. We are citizens of this county. The stuff with this universe, uh, unified development code, this transgender stuff, the drag queen show at the library, uh, multi-use path and all the, the support animals. It's like, totally agree with Pam. And I've been saying it too. Let's look at what the what's really going on in our country because we're, the, the market is going to crash and there will be a new pandemic that shows up and nobody's going to be able to go anywhere. So think about that before you're starting new things like spending money on the diversity stuff and the d inclusion. It's all so woke. And woke is just a really good word for broke. It's also a really good word, or it's a different word than like socialism and Marxism and communism. It's the whole entree into that. So we see it. I hope you see it. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're just so used to hearing what the ARC wants that you just do whatever they say that you, or the developers, and whoever's paying money, whatever. Um, but all this, all this stuff, this unified development code, all this stuff, this is all stuff that when the government says, the federal government says, oh, here, we're gonna give you some money. We're gonna give you some money if you do this. If you do the unified, unified development code, if you do this, uh, equity, inclusion, diversity stuff. Oh, we'll, we'll give you some more money. And those come with some major handcuffs. I mean, look at the handcuffs that we're dealing with with the buses that are always empty. And we're spending lots of money on the buses. And we will because we got into the handcuff thing with these grants. So think about how you're spending our money. Thank you. Chairwoman, this is the last uh, speaker for the first portion. Thank you. I'd like to take a five-minute recess before we go into consent. Thank you.
Now resuming our Board of Commissioners meeting. The first matter that we have up is for consent, but I must tell you, um, we are very pleased tonight that we have a new candidate, hopefully soon to be new director within Cobb County. And um, I think those of us here who come to these meetings regularly have adjusted to the tone of public comment, but it, um, it certainly we want everybody to be able to express themselves. But I almost felt as if I need to put the matter of appointing the director first before he left. <laughs> you know, we are certainly going through a lot of change in this county and um, there are certainly a lot of issues to address. There are a lot of changes nationally, locally. We're still in the th hanging tough through a pandemic and all of the impacts of that and just um, so many changes politically, um, socially, and I'm hoping, Mr. Jim Harner, that you and you're dealing with people can understand where people may be at this time. And so we're going to move forward with our consent agenda and then hopefully after the consent agenda, you and your beautiful wife who I think of next, is next to you will still be here so we can make that appointment happen. With that, before our meeting, we have the consent agenda item scrolling on um, the screens and for those at home should have been able to see it as well. Also at the conclusion of this meeting, we'll also have the consent agenda item scrolling. We've had um, a couple of revisions to items 7 and 14. I'm not aware of any other revisions unless um, commissioners want to bring anything else to my attention. With that, I move that we approve the consent agenda items as revised and authorize execution of the necessary documents by the appropriate county personnel. Second. Is there any discussion? Um, I cannot um, support agenda items number five and six on the agenda um, after much discussion with our county attorney. Essentially, uh, these agenda items are increasing the budget of the DA in order for them to perform services, and we have not um, given other departments increases in their budgets to do so. Okay. For the public that may be wondering what those items are, items five is to approve a contract with the Georgia Department of Human Services and the Cobb Judicial Circuit District Attorney to provide child support services to the citizens of Cobb County. And agenda item number six is to accept one-time supplemental funding in support of a contract with the Georgia Department of Human Services and the Cobb Judicial Circuit district attorney to provide child support services to the citizens of Cobb County. So there's a question. So, from, uh, and again, I had a long, I know I heard Commissioner Burrell said that these are grants and um, while there are grants, there is also a contract that's associated with this grant. And that is where um, my issue came with because again, they have budgets and they've entered into this contract knowing that they don't have the funding to fulfill the obligations of the contract without asking for an additional $320,459 from the general fund that wasn't budgeted. And again, we've had other courts come and ask for supplemental funding in order to continue to do their business in the courts and we have denied that. Um, so while I understand that these are some of the functions uh, this comes down to me as a budgeting issue. Thank you, commissioners. Um, because I've heard two side questions and there has been a robust response by Commissioner Gamble, I'm going to pull items five and six from consent so that we can discuss this after. And I don't know if we have representation here from the DA's office. In lieu of that, if finance can at least help us or our county attorney can help us not, excuse me, not county attorney, county manager can help us in addressing this item to the best of your ability. I just don't think it's appropriate to continue to have back and forth on consent. Okay. I agree. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments on consent? 
All right, we'll call the question. The motion passes 5-0. And again, we'll hear items five and six. Is there representation from the district attorney's office here this evening? With that, I'll just turn to our county manager for your assistance to the best of your ability in light of them not being here tonight. And finance, if you're able to help address this item, as um, it's the budgeting of this matter that's been. Madam Chair, Commissioners, yes. we have not had robust conversations with the DA about this. Okay. He did provide a response to Commissioner Gambrell. Uh, we did speak with finance, and finance also sp uh, spoke with the DA's office, who I thought spoke with legal earlier about it. And it was my understanding that initially it was just the vernacular, the word contract versus grant. And uh, when I spoke with our CFO, I thought we were at a point where the commissioner was uh, comfortable with the explanation that had been provided by uh, the DA's office. It, it is only now that I'm aware that the issue still was not um, covered to your satisfaction. So I do not feel comfortable speaking on behalf okay. of the district attorney's office uh, at this point. But what I would say perhaps is if you would like to pull the items all together, and perhaps bring them back, we're happy to do that. But okay. as I understood it from you, Commissioner Gambrin, I may have been wrong that it was really the, how it was worded, contract versus uh, grant relative to this particular issue, not so much the, the money itself in binding the general fund to fund something you know that is not supported by the grant. Thank you. I'm sorry. Right. Commissioner and Burl, I'm sorry. Commissioner Gamble, if you'd like to right. respond, and I, I'll go to Burl and then Commissioner Sheffield. Go ahead, Commissioner Gamble. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Burl, go ahead. It's difficult to moderate. As you know, comments go through the chair, and I'm trying to balance having two other commissioners that have questions. And I did not see your hand or hear that you had wanted to respond, Commissioner. Again, you're free to do so. But if you're not going to, now I'm going to go to Commissioner Burrell and then to Commissioner Sheffield. Go ahead. And again, I went to respond because the county manager was asking me a question directly. Uh, so essentially, I'm sorry. Let's, let's stop this for a second. We're going to have some decorum about how we do things. I had called Commissioner Burrell because you didn't respond. So we're going to have Commissioner Burrell and and then um, I said, Commissioner Sheffield, and then you can respond. I, I don't want to be in this position. Go ahead, Commissioner Burrell. Um, my question is, first of all, I think they should be pulled, since no one is here from the DA's office, to, okay. to um, clarify. But also, is there a time frame involved that if, if we do pull it in, and hear it in two weeks, Will they miss a deadline? Does it say yes. in here? Monique, do you say something? What I can say is that most grants, typically if they're state grants, do have a, a June 30th expiration to start July 1st through a calendar year of June 30th. There may be some implications. I'm not sure. Uh, again, because this was a consent item, uh, and was discussed during uh, agenda work session, um, that was the time where they would have been available to answer the questions. I'm perceiving that they thought all of the questions had been answered and therefore are not here. Okay. Um, so whether there are implications that may impact their ability to, to continue the programming, I cannot speak to okay. that and I apologize to the board for that. I will ask uh, our finance CFO if he would come forward because I do believe he did have some conversation with the uh, DA's office about this agenda item in uh, question for Commissioner Gamble. Uh, so yes, the questions that we received were mostly re regarding the additional funding that was required and the language regarding the agenda item, whether it was a grant or contract. I know we worked through legal's office to kind of flush that out, but I think Commissioner Gamble's point was she was not comfortable with the additional funding that would be associated with these. A lot of grants that we have throughout the county have salary caps based on positions. So when the county salary would exceed that cap, there would be additional funding required, and I believe that is the case here. Are you able to answer Commissioner Burrell's question about, or um, Dr. McMorris's similar question about the date? I do not know the date, I'm sorry. Okay. I do Thank not you. have that, that answer. Okay. 
Thank you. Madam Chair, may I suggest that we just hold this and go on with the agenda and maybe we could contact someone from Thank the DA's you. office? I will note that and I think the board can consider Excuse that. Excuse me, uh, uh, Chairwoman, if, if you look at the contract, uh, it does say uh, the initial contract was uh, July 1 to 2021 with an expiration date of June 30th, 2022. So this is a renewal? Yes. So is, isn't it already funded in the budget? What? It is partially funded, but to the extent that it is fully funded, it is not. So what the DA's office is, is asking the board to bridge the gap. So the contract will expire at the end of this month. So it seems time may be of the essence. Time is of, of, the, of the essence, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Sheffield. I mean, yeah, it, and that's basically, I was just going to draw everyone's attention to the third paragraph in the background, and it has an expiration date of uh, June 2023, so the assumption was that it expires June 30th of this year. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there any other comments or questions? Commissioner so, Gare. Oh, so oh, I'm, I'm sorry, not, I didn't realize you weren't done. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Madam Chair. So I'm not sure where we are with respect to pulling this if the deadline date is just two days away. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Gambrell or Commissioner Richardson, do you have any comments or questions? Thank you. In response to your question, Dr. McMorris, um, I had a long conversation with a member of our county attorney's office staff, I had additional questions and those were never answered. Thank you. This will be my, my request. Um, we know time is of the essence. However, we are very fortunate that we see our DA walking in the door. Uh -huh. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> somebody. Mm -hmm. somebody. I was told y'all had a question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> One or two. Yes. If, Thank you. We're here discussing items five and six, and if someone can help pass in the agenda items, we'll give you a moment to take a look at that. And I'll start back with Commissioner Gambrell. She had some concerns with respect to the item, and then there were some other questions okay. that you may be able to answer. So I'll just, I'll just give um, the DA a moment to take a look at those items. In fact, why don't we go ahead, we'll um, take a break for about five minutes and give him adequate time and we'll come back. Thank you.
and uh, welcome back to our Board of Commissioners meeting this evening. We are here addressing items five and items six on our consent agenda with our district attorney. And Commissioner Gamble, have you had some questions to address with our DA? Uh, yes, uh, essentially the agenda item says that, um, you know, they're requesting funding of a total of $320,459.17 because they have an analysis of expenditures over the past year which reflects that shortage. Therefore, I cannot support this agenda item. We have not funded other departments that have had shortages or have need additional funding to, in order to run their offices. Thank you. Um, Howard, DA, do you want to respond to that matter? In the past, the, the county has subsidized our child support unit. Um, it's been doing that for probably the past 10 to 15 years. Um, without that money, we cannot fund this um, department at all. Ba basically, that department, even though it receives federal and state funding, it's not enough to cover the salaries and all the things that they do. And they do a, um, very tremendous work here in Cobb County as far as making sure that the kids that um, are not getting child support are getting those child support orders, uh, collecting the money to provide for the child support for our, our children in our community. Um, item number six, the, the state found some money that they hadn't appropriated before and, and, and subsidized us to reduce some of the subsidy that we have been providing, um, almost cutting it in half as I see that. Um, but this is something that the county has always done in the past. It's, it's and I guess cause, because of the need. Thank you. Commissioner, go ahead. But then I guess this is a question to the county manager and also to Bill Volkman. If this has been going on for 10 years, why aren't we doing a better job budgeting? What I hear you asking is why haven't we done a better job budgeting? Every budgetary item comes before the Board of Commissioners for approval. So the DA stands here today to ask you to support something that has been going on for over a decade. And, and the fact is, this is the budget request for this department. Yeah. It's, so on it, a, it's a pre-planned expense mm -hmm. that we know is going to occur. It's not something that all of a sudden, at the end of the year, I have asked you for another $250,000. So we're here tonight, and my recommendation would be if the board chooses to move forward with the item, then vote your conscience. If you choose not to support the item, you don't support it. But it's a policy decision, not a budgetary decision at this point, Commissioner. And while I understand that, and I understand the DA's response, the wording under the impact statement is the analysis of expenditures over the past year reflects the shortage, which means it was not funded correctly. Well, the shortage comes from the amount that the state gives us through federal and state money. And so we calculate what we are going to actually expend, and that's where the shortage comes from. And that's the subsidy that we ask for in this uh, request. Do any other commissioners have any comments or questions? Commissioner Burrell. Good evening, Mr. DA. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, so we don't know till the till the budget, I mean till the grant is up for renewal each year, what we're short or over or we don't know exactly what we're gonna money. get until we actually get the contract. And we usually only get the contract maybe a month before this presentation actually occurs. Mm -hmm. And even the subsidy, we only got a couple of weeks ago that they were going to even subsidize us some, some additional money. So when you budget, like, is this proposed for next year's budget? That Correct. We're, we're working on now? 
But we, we, you won't know the exact amount until the grant comes through from right. the we, state? We won't know the exact amount that we're going to need to subsidize until we get the actual grant okay. numbers. And the deadline is in two days. Well, the problem with child support is they, they're on the um, fiscal year of the, of the state July government 1. versus our fiscal year. Okay. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Richardson. Thank you. So when we're basically kind of at the mercy of the state on this one, it's when they stand up their next appropriation cycle, stand up, come to their agreement on their budget cycle, that's going to determine, again, another unfunded mandate, <laughs> partially funded mandate from the state and the federal government, correct? That's correct, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner. And I just simply want to add, I know that there are several departments that have come before the Board of Commissioners in advance of the budget being passed to ask for funding to staff, um, to appropriately staff um, um, employees to help move the work along. But for me, where this is different, we're dealing with children in this respect, and we're dealing with support for those children financial support, namely. So, you know, th there are incidences where we will need to determine and, you know, I dare say prioritize the importance of um, staffing that we, um, that, that we um, put ahead of the budget items. But I think this is one of those items, considering the interest of time and the deadline just being two days away and the services that will come out on the other side of this are our children, in most cases, our most vulnerable children yes, that will receive support for, um, uh, for lunch during summer school or during the summer when they don't have meals available to them um, for medical care and whatever financial supplements they family, their families may be in need of. So for that reason, I support this agenda item. And Commissioner Sheffield, just so you know, this, this request has no additional personnel attached to it. This is funding for the current staff that we have, which for instance, in our, in our child support division has not changed in the last 20 years. And this county has more than doubled in that time frame. And the number of staff that we have in child support has not changed. Thank you. Commissioner Gambrell. So with that being said, you don't really need these funds because we've already funded these staff members 100% in our budget. Because usually these grants are written that the um, match will be a salary from that employee. This grant doesn't work that way, Commissioner. Um, basically, based on our population, the state has a pot of money and they give us a certain percentage. Uh, and that's matched by the federal government almost double what the state gives us. And that still gives us, leaves us falling short of what we need to run that office. But again, are these, so I know it says that the, the grant covers these salaries, but are these, because usually when we have grant applications, it says that the grant money is no longer available, the program goes away. So then my question is, is are these, um, 17 full-time employees and one part-time are these Cobb County employees that are funded in our current existing budget. And is that you or Bill, <laughs> Jackie? They, they are current Cobb County employees. Um, there's a couple of state employees in the, in the um, child support office. But like I said, the grant money does not fully cover the salaries um, that are reflected in our office. Right, but those salaries are covered in our general fund. Only if Correct. we add the subsidy from the grant money. Okay. So, Commissioner, these, these like several other grant positions that ha are primarily state or federal funded are actually not in the general fund. They're in the county's grant fund. So that's where you have run into unique challenges when you have state and federal caps on salaries. For example, if our pay exceeds their cap, there is a general fund match, and that's exactly our contribution or subsidy that would go along with the grant to continue to provide the service. Because you have a grant or a contract to provide a service, 
and they set the cost, that doesn't mean that's what our cost is. So if we wanna to continue to provide a service, there is a general fund component, and we have several grants like that. So although these, some of these, these positions are, do have state and federal dollars tied to them, they're not 100% funded that way because of those caps. So you do have several grant and grant programs throughout the county that have a general fund component tied to those because of those caps. So these are not out of the general fund. If you notice in the funding statement, everything you'll see for the fund is 270, that's our grant fund. Mm -hmm. So these are not gonna be part of the operating budget that we would discuss in the annual adoption process. But what we do always include is we base the subsidy on the prior year so we have that starting point, and then if the state or federal government's funding were to change, we have to be fluid with that if we want to continue the program. So it's not like we're going from zero to a new no, a high number. It's based on their funding and their restrictions year to year, and then also policy decisions that we make as a county to determine, one, what is our health care costs? That's going to be part of this, this employee's cost, pension, so on and so forth. So those are all factors that will drive that number that the state and federal government won't take into consideration. It's just simply this is your cap per employee and anything we do above and beyond that we have to come out of pocket for. I hope that helps. Thank you, Commissioner Richardson, and then I'll come to you for all. Okay, last question just for clarification's sake. Um, and they're kind of related, but you know, considering this is a shortage, you started to answer, it sounds like what is the shortage due to and did the state reduce their, their contribution to this? Is this something, have they kept the cap at the same? It, it really, I, I can't speak to the level of funding and I'll let the DA address that as far as where there's, there is, but what we do is, like I said, the biggest driver of our increased cost are things that we don't have control over, pension and healthcare being the two primary. Mm -hmm. So as we increase those year over year, we're gonna continue to add to that subsidy. But as far as whether the state funding increased or decreased year to year, I, I don't know if the DA can answer that based on where we were for last year, but we again we start with the subsidy that we had for the previous year. Okay, so so this increase of the health care and the pension costs are separate than what we budget for with the increase of the health care and pension costs. That is correct. Mm -hmm. So what, because because we do have that tied through, we do like to, we always try to factor that in as a as a placeholder to say what the subsidy will go up as, but it's it's unpredictable to say what the state's level of funding is going to be. Thank you. And, and we were actually surprised when they gave us the subsidy because basically they, they reduced the budget by 14% the last two years. And for this, for some reason this year, they said, we're going to give it back to you. Thank you. Commissioner Burrell. Um, I just want to reiterate, I guess, that these are not new positions. They're re renewals for grants that have been in place for quite some time. Yes, ma'am. And because of the um, cap on the grant funding, the subsidy changes year to year. Is and that I think um, what Bill was saying, based on our health care costs and other costs for fringe benefits, those things as they go up, yes, the, the cost is going to go up if we don't receive additional funding from the state. So you're not asking for additional positions like um, no, other folks have come to us from different departments. No, ma'am. This, this is system. for the current number that we have in the office right this now. This has been ongoing for yes. years. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Gambrell. Right, but the reason why he needs this additional funding is because we are paying these employees more than what the state says they should be paid. So to me, this is no different than another um, department coming in and wanting additional funds to pay their employees to do that job. Um, you know, I know we're doing a pay in class study, but it means if the state is stating that, you know, these employees should be paid this, we're paying them more, that is why we need the subsidy. So to me, this is no different than any of the requests that the other departments have made, needing additional funding. Okay. Commissioner, I, I would disagree with that. And, and just for the fact that um, these people already work for Cobb County. Um, we're not asking for anything additional for them other than what they're entitled to. This is, this is not us saying that we're trying to raise their salaries or anything like that. This is what 
Um, these folks in, in um, child support have not had a raise. They didn't get the raise that the state got. They, they, they have not had anything additional that we would factor into the cost. So this, this is basically us saying, this is what we did last year. We're going to do the same thing this year. It's, it's, no, it's no different than that. And, and while I hear you, but again, in the impact statement, it says it's the annual salary and fringe increases that have been approved that are driving this increase that you're requesting today. And any annual salary increase would be the merit increases that they would have been entitled to, and then the fringe benefits that go along with that increase. Commissioner yeah. Sheffield and then Commissioner Richardson. The, the DA answered my question. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Richardson. Okay. Yeah, if you go to the back page of that where you know kind of the assumption where it says the federal and state grant that comes in, their their portion of it, if you total that up, it does cover the salary. It's literally everything else. It looks like our subsidy, which is actually directly tied to some of the things Bill had referenced, disability. FICA, medical, life insurance, retirement, workers' comp, dental, office supplies, so on. So that looks like that's more of the portion that we're covering. So um, it seems like it is spelled out here, at least. It is, and, and, and that's, that's a correct assumption. Um, if you look at the numbers that the federal and state money do cover what we consider salary. Correct. It's greater than, actually. Yes. It's almost 900 grand. So um, I think all of us know a lot more about how we fund these positions than we ever knew before. And this matter comes before us annually. And you know, considering today's discussion, if there's some way that we can have some of the substance of this reflected in the agenda item, um, when it's presented next year, it may alleviate us having some of the same questions. I know. Um, You've been in your term for two years, and this has been a repetitive item, and it's been shared by our finance director that we typically do have to supplement this. I don't know if there's any way we can build that proactively in the budget, but it may alleviate this conversation. I don't know if you have, oh, I don't know if you were going to make a statement with respect to that, because really it's up to the board to present a budget that adequately covers our operations. And for that, I feel um, um, uncomfortable that we've put you in this situation because if we've known this is a recurring expense, then you know we're putting you in the hot seat, but it's really up to us up here on the dais to make sure that we're making financial decisions that cover your ongoing operations adequately. So Thank we'll you, just ask for that in the future, and we currently do have a budget before us. I don't know if it adequately covers what the um, anticipated costs are for supplementing this. Bill, if you can help respond, yes. please. Yes, it, it does for 2023, because okay. this is something that we, we factor into our conversations, but that's going to be our challenge. It's Again, it's an estimate, because as the DA talked about, we won't know the final number until the next contract, next yeah. award, and what that's going to look like. Right, which can, we never know. It could be subject to so many whims from the state and the federal yes. government. Again, I would just ask when we do have the agenda item that somehow there's some verbiage in there that just relates that variability to why we are coming forward with that with this request. You know, I'd hate to impugn anything um, to our DA when this is not necessarily in his control. We're trying to maintain operations so that we can do, as Commissioner Sheffield stated, to be able to serve the children of this county. Did anybody else have anything to add? But I'm sorry. that's okay. Go ahead, Commissioner Brown. Bill, you made a statement that this is out of a grant fund, not the general fund. Is that just the subsidy? No, no. The, or I'm the sorry. whole thing? The subsidy comes from the general fund. These positions and all the state and federal funding associated with this program will go into the grant in a fund. Grant fund. Okay. And because the, the state and federal funding associated with this is not sufficient to cover the program, the general fund does have to kick in the subsidy component. So we do have, as a part of our 2023, the, the reoccurring or the estimated subsidy for the fiscal year 23 built into the numbers. But as the DA said, you know, we can have that. But if the state comes back next year and says, we're reducing your funding by 10 percent, that's still going to be an ongoing conversation that we'll have each year. Now, that, that unfortunately, just based on our fiscal years and their fiscal years, 
There's not a good way around that. We can definitely work with the board to try to beef up the language and help make that a little bit more clear on the agenda when it comes back next year. And ideally, it's the same level, and we don't have much have to really have much of a conversation. But if there was a significant decrease, there would be additional dollars that would be required to continue this program. Okay. Thank you. With that, commissioners, I'm going to make a motion that we approve agenda item number five and six as um, presented. Second. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 4-1. Thank you. Thank you. All right. With that, we are moving on to our regular agenda. And as I provided before, I'm praying that Mr. Jim Harner is still with us. Are you still here? You have weathered the storm. I'm going to turn things over to our county manager to introduce this next agenda item. Good evening, Chairwoman, Commissioners. It is a great pleasure that I uh, introduce to you and ask that you accept the recommendation of the appointment of Mr. Jim Harner to be the county's chief human resources officer. Mr. Harner has extensive HR leadership experience, including that of the private sector, health care industry, and local government. He has 25 years of HR experience in employee relations, policy and procedure development, compensation and benefits, recruitment and retention, training and development, and he will no doubt be an asset to Cobb County government. He most recently worked as the HR director for the city of Roswell. He is also uh, a certified professional by their professional organization known as, known as SHRM, which is the Human Resources Society for um, Human Resource Management. Therefore, it is with great pleasure that I make the recommendation to appoint uh, Mr. Jim Harner as the Board of Commissioners, uh, his staff, and the, to the management team that he be appointed the Chief Human Resources Officer effective July 25th, 2022. And I would just ask the board to accept that recommendation and to ask him if he would like to come up once you've made your, your vote. Certainly. Um, with that, I move that we approve this agenda item as presented. Second. Is there any discussion? We'll call the question. The motion passes 5-0. We want to thank you, Mr. Carter. We're going to put you not on the hot seat, but under the bright light so that we can introduce you to Cobb County. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you. It's certainly an honor and privilege to be here uh, this evening. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. McMorris and her staff. Uh, it's been a little bit of a process um, because once I attended an interview, we had a uh, death in the family. Uh, so I thought I was out of the running. I had to uh, attend to that as family matters go. Uh, but fortunately, uh, again, the, the staff, the HR staff, Dr. McMorris, were gracious enough to uh, revisit the possibility of me joining Cobb County. Uh, this feels like coming home professionally. Um, my lovely wife, Julie, and I have been married 37 years, and we've lived 25 years here in Cobb County, so it's nice to professionally come on home. Um, be a little shorter commute, too, which isn't bad. But uh, again, I thank you all uh, for the vote of confidence, and I look forward to working with you all with all the very professional staff I've met so far, and I look forward to meeting everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Commission. Thank you, and before we go on to our next item, I do wanna make sure that I thank our HR team that has really had to step up with the absence of us having a director. Um, Glenda, thank you so much for your leadership in this process. And again, to all of those with It takes a lot to keep us running. All right. I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay, Glenda. <laughs> it's been a long day. 
Glenda, the good witch. All right, we are now going to move on to our regular transportation tab. Good evening, Chairwoman, Commissioners. Uh, Drew Ressler, Transportation. Uh, DOT has seven items for presentation this evening. Our first item is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve supplemental agreement number six to the Cobb Framework Agreement with Town Center Community Improvement District for additional design services on South Barrett Reliever, phase three. Project numbers X2407, TCID 26, authorize the corresponding budget transactions and further authorize the chairwoman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Burrell. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Our next item is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve a memorandum of agreement with the Georgia Department of Transportation for the oversight of the preliminary engineering of the Dallas Highway at Lost Mountain Road, Mars Hill Road, Cobb County Project number X2305, authorize a corresponding budget transaction and further authorize the chairwoman to execute the, next, the necessary documents. Commissioner Gambrell. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Our next item is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve a non-exclusive temporary construction easement and temporary driveway easement with the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia on attractive land identified as project parcel number four for construction of improvements on Campus Loop Road, Big Shaney Road, Chastain Road, project number X2303 and authorized showman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Burrell. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Our next item is to recommend the Board of Commissioners determine that circumstances are such that it is necessary to proceed with condemnation proceedings by declaration of taking under OCGA section 32-3-4. Authorize the commencement of condemnation proceedings on six parcels on Lower Roswell Road, project number E6020. Adopt resolutions and orders in form substantially similar to the attached and as approved by the County Attorney's Office. And further authorize the Chairwoman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Richardson. Yes, motion to approve. Need a second for discussion. All right, I'll second for discussion. All right. Discussion. So, I'll kick things off. Right. <laughs> Certainly a lot of interest around this particular um, item and so appreciate all of staff's work on this. There, there were a couple of questions that came up both during public comment and during some of our public outreach meetings. Um, somewhat related to this agenda item, but primarily related to the project in totality. And I do want to make that distinction. Um, but the first is with regards to the bike lanes. There was a question as to whether or not the bike lanes, that there, that the bike lanes weren't included as a part of the um, SPLOS designation when, in 2011. And curious on your, just a response on that side. Absolutely. Uh, bike lanes currently exist on Lower Roswell Road between uh, Timber Ridge and Davidson to the east of this project for a length of about 2.7 miles. Uh, this particular project identifies um, uh, safety and operational improvements on Lower Roswell between uh, the end of those bike lanes from Davidson to Woodlawn. There's been a number of projects over the years and in previous SPLOS programs on Lower Roswell Road to include the uh, just overall roadway improvements as well as the roundabout down at, at Timber Ridge. Uh, when this project came about, and, and it's gone through a number of different iterations in concepts, but each of those iterations has had side, uh, or has had bike lanes uh, to accommodate the, the existing bikers in the area. Uh, be, because of the uh, just the previous plans on the on Lower Roswell Road, which have identified that, and bringing a, a more logical termini uh, from Davidson further west through the intersection of Johnson Ferry to Woodlawn, uh, just being a, a more logical end of those of those turn lanes. And uh, just like any other project, uh, any, any SPLOS project does not name every specific element to be included within those projects. 
uh, much like a development that comes in, the, the primary goal of the development is to build the development, but also in building that development needs to bring the adjacent roadways up to current standards. In the same way here, uh, a, an operational safety improvement on Lower Roswell Road includes bringing up that road to current standards inclusive of, of previous planning efforts that have identified improvements on that roadway. Thank you. Um, so on that point as well with the bike lanes, it was mentioned earlier about um, the safety standard by having bikes, different modalities on the same road. What was, um, I know that was something you looked into and what is the feedback on that standpoint? Absolutely. The, the primary crashes, the, the Lower Roswell Road in this section has a crash rate about four and a half times the statewide average on, on similar roadways. Uh, in, in reviewing each of those crashes, and staff has gone through in, in two different three-year periods, uh, the vast majority, over 50% of crashes in both of those segments were, were uh, to be correctable by a median. Uh, there's a, a number of driveways, between, particularly between Johnson Ferry and Davidson on the east end, the east half of the, the project. Uh, each, of those project uh, each of those driveways having uh, left turns out, left turns ins is causing additional conflict points. I believe there are 14 driveways in about a quarter mile section of, of roadways. And that, that's really where the crashes are happening is because of those turning movements. And, and, and so, uh, we're, whereas we're, we are not seeing the crashes uh, associated with cyclists, we're seeing the crashes associated with driveways. So that's the purpose of the, of the median there. In terms of the, the bike lane, uh, there are uh, varying levels of comfort that particular bicyclists have. There are some cyclists, uh, for example, when I go with uh, my children, I, I, I don't let them ride on the road. I require them to be on the sidewalk and on trails, uh, all the way up to uh, more the more avid cyclists that are comfortable riding on, uh, on the roadways. Uh, this, this project does accommodate both in providing a multi-use path on the south side of Lower Roswell Road, as well as the bicycle lanes that provide a dedicated space, where, whereas rather than having the cyclist share space with vehicles, where there are differing speeds in the same space, it provides a dedicated space for those cyclists. And we have no current idea on the volume of cyclists in the area. We though. do not. Um, and then it was also questioned about a potential of increasing other types of accidents with the median. Is that, that they wouldn't be accidents that we see today, but a different type of accident? Is that something that you had mentioned or? It, it is not. I, I, uh, with the reviewing the crashes and the results of the crashes being from the numerous driveways, having uh, vehicles turning left in and left out, uh, in particular, we see a lot of uh, what we call a two-stage turn, someone coming out of the driveway, turning into the center turn lane, and then merging over. Uh, doing that in a section where traffic is doing the opposite, going the opposite direction, and creating a lot of confusion, a lot of different areas that vehicles are coming from. Uh, so as, as a traffic engineer, we, we do believe that uh, installation of the median would simplify the movements throughout the area, resulting in a net decrease in crashes. Okay, are there other roads in the county that are of similar design with similar metrics? There are the most recent uh, similar project that uh, created, go, went from a five lane section from a four lane section. So two travel lanes in either direction with the center turn lane, to two travel lanes in either direction with a center median. The most recent of those projects is Sandy Plains, very similar makeup in terms of overall volume, uh, commercial adjacent to it, and uh, that, that project uh, was completed as a result of some of the crashes, operational challenges that were occurring on Sandy Plains. Okay, so we, and we saw improvements with adjustments yes. on that. Um, the other thing that came up, and this was just kind of mentioned in general in passing, but the duration of the project and the impact during construction. What, I mean, I don't know if there's an answer to that, but there is certainly a concern around that with regards to this project, considering it's a heavily trafficked area. Absolutely, much like Sandy Plains that I just mentioned and many of our other, of our other projects on major thoroughfares, uh, we recognize that there's an opportunity to improve traffic flows in the end condition where we see uh, based on our models, 
anticipate a 30% improvement in traffic at Johnson Ferry, a 30% improvement in traffic at Woodlawn during the peak hours because of this project. However, with those advantages post-construction, there, there are challenges and traffic congestion during construction. To be mindful of that, we do our best to balance. Uh, the more work we do, the more production the contractor has in a given day, the faster they can get that done and the shorter the duration of the project. Uh, on the other end, the less painful that project is on a daily basis, the, the less hours we give, the less production they make, the longer that, that project goes. So to balance those competing interests of getting the project done quickly, but also not adversely impacting the residents and businesses in the area, we, we work to uh, avoid the peak hour, so avoid the morning peak hour, avoid the afternoon peak hour. If there are any other unique circumstances on a particular project, we avoid that as well. Uh, and, and locate our work during the, the less traveled times of the day. Okay. And then last, um, last two things. One is more of an explanation that I think will be beneficial because I know when I asked you, it was pretty enlightening for me, but the condemnation process itself, considering this agenda item is specifically referring to condemnations of parcels, um, you had kind of shared with me from a business perspective, what that, how that proceeds, and, and how that's perceived even from a larger business. Absolutely, and I, and I can break my answer into the residential parcels, parcels four through eight, and then the more commercial parcel, parcel number 25. Uh, parcels four through eight, our right-of-way management, our right-of-way staff have had multiple meetings with the residents, and those meetings have been very positive, and we, we do believe that condemnation may not be necessary. We, we've had, like I said, some very productive conversations there. This is really more of a time mechanism, this particular request, but, but we're hopeful, as we are with all condemnation cases, that even with authorization to condemn, it's something that we only do as a last resort. Uh, regarding the commercial property, uh, looking over the, the timeline, initial contact was made with this particular property owner in September of 2021, uh, so this was, was, was last year. Um, there have been no substantial responses to our requests. In fact, um, they've been contacted uh, more than 10 times since January when they assigned outside counsel to the acquisition and with, again, no, no counter offer received to the appraisal that the county has provided. And, and oftentimes with businesses, as I understand it, the, um, there, there's a, a benefit either because of their internal processes or because of just uh, how those businesses work and how the, the uh, reimbursement of, of property acquisition works, uh, where it is beneficial for the, for the amount to be paid into court in order for those proceedings to happen and then any payouts from a condemnation that has begun, even if it does not go all the way to a jury trial, uh, is non-taxable because it is settlement of, of litigation. So it's okay. not, not uncommon for businesses to go through condemnation. Thank you. And then the very last thing I have, and <laughs> you'll turn it over, um, but for this project, is, is it something you could commit to to continue having conversations with the community about um, some other design options and improvements on the, obviously I made a motion to approve but um, that that would continue absolutely uh, we, we've already identified a, a number of items that we can include within uh, the limits of the project um, th there are cost and, and time implications if we were to move curb lines um, however we have looked at things like uh, pavement markings, raised pavement markings, landscaping, uh, additional signage to increase the visibility, safety, and operations on this section. We'll continue to look at those and glad to, to continue to speak with the community, um, it, it, and particularly in advance of, of let of the construction in addition to the de those design elements. There will be construction impacts uh, from the utility relocations and ultimately the contractor. Uh, so both elements that we can include within the project as well as what those construction impacts are. We're always glad to communicate and coordinate with the community. Thank you. And thanks for all of the uh, due diligence. I, I know there have been a couple of community meetings to try to pull in all of the information. So Absolutely. I appreciate that. Commissioner Burrell. Thank you. Drew, um, I know there has been a lot of discussion uh, on this project um, and initially because this has always been in district 2 um, I got involved just recently with um, the Woodlawn Gates HOA 
because of the condemnation that was on the books on the agenda a month or so ago. That's right. um, and I know that Janice Killian has been working diligently with the HOA and the neighborhood um, on their right away and, and these condemnations. Um, and they understand that it's a last resort and they've been cooperating and working with her in negotiations and, and um, you know, counter offers and, and everything to try to work that out. Um, and I'm not sure where they are with the Bank of America, but I know that's the only business that's in this agenda item. Um, my, my concern is the fact that this was a 2011 SPLOS project that was approved um, by the voters and it, it was delayed and it's 2022. Um, and that's not, I mean, I don't know the reason or, or why the previous District 2 commissioner did delay that. Um, I know the project that you referenced on Sandy Plains is my is in my district, and um, when we made the intersection improvements at Piedmont and Sandy Plains, um, the next the last segment of uh, median on Sandy Plains was Kinjack to Ebenezer, and I delayed that project because we had just done the intersection improvements at Piedmont and Sandy Plains. And I didn't want the businesses and the school traffic and the citizens to have to endure another year of construction in the same area. But that was delayed for like two years and it was still in the same splost. It wasn't delayed for um, 10 or 12 years. So um, I think and, and it doesn't have bike lanes on Sandy Plains or Piedmont. So that's not, that part is not a true comparison because right. you don't have, you do have a lot of traffic there because I, I travel it every day just about. But um, there are no bike lanes at Sandy Plains and um, Piedmont. And I do think that that is dangerous being on the road. So I had asked um, at work session if this could be revisited. Um, I'd like to see if they're going to be bike lanes, if they could be up with the sidewalk and not in the roadway adjacent or whatever, or some other options um, that it could be revisited and not. And, and I know the negotiations are ongoing um, with the homeowners and the Bank of America. So I, I'd, I'd like, I don't support this going forward tonight. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Sheffield. A quick question for Drew. There was reference to um, the project being a 2011 SPLOS project. And my question is, and perhaps this is also for the audience, is there an expiration date attached to SPLOS projects? I, I would leave that for the county attorney's office. No, there's not, not, not necessarily a particular expiration date, except when the funds either expire or a project becomes uh, infeasible. So theoretically, this is still a viable project. The sure, it's, a, vi time. it's okay. a viable project, but the funds, because of con the uh, uh, contributions, the collection is already ended, so it would be capped on whatever the um, amount of funds would be left. I, I just wanted to provide clarification. Right. And remember when we say a 2011 SPLOS project or we say a 2016 project, that's the year it starts, not the year that it ultimately ends on collections. So. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Thank you, Richardson. Yeah. Um, and Bill, you mentioned a term um, as well, the infeasible. I'm uh, just curious on what the standard of infeasibility is, if you have that. Well, it, the board would have to make the decision if after staff recommended that the project was not feasible to be able to conclude. There's a, a number of different steps that we would have to go through to be able to make that determination. But, but the way that the SPLOST is set up with multiple tiers on projects, 
this is still a project that's within the tier for it to be completed and there's funds to be able to do that. Thank you, thank you. And Drew, just to cycle back on the, cycle back, uh, revisit the <laughs> bike link question about safety. Um, I, I, and I really just wanna understand because it's my understanding that the separation of lanes is the safety aspect to it. It's not the idea of you know, encouraging bike usage, it's having the bike lane create separation of modalities. And part of the last question I asked was that we would have additional time to continue to look into what is something um, amenable for moving forward as far as the design. Of course, with the end of the, the existing bike lanes at Davidson, uh, it, and that being just really in the middle of the section between Johnson Ferry and, and Timber Ridge, uh, the extension of those bike lanes, the dedicated space, will allow for those, those cyclists to uh, continue in the existing bike lanes uh, through Johnson Ferry Road, rather than having to transition from a dedicated bike lane to a shared lane with uh, traffic that, that is going in excess of 40 miles an hour. So being able to, to serve the cyclists that are there uh, with a dedicated bicycle lane rather than sharing it is a safety improvement over existing conditions. Okay, thank you. That answers all of my questions. All right, seeing no further discussion, I'll call the question. The motion passes 3-2 with Commissioners Burrell and Gamble in opposition. Thank you. Our next item is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve supplemental agreement number five to the consultant services agreement with HNTB Corporation an amount not to exceed $50,000 for engineering services on Windy Hill Road, Terrell Mill Road connector, project number X2401. Approve a time extension through October 14th, 2022. Authorize a corresponding budget transaction and further authorize the chairwoman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Richardson. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Our next item is recommend the Board of Commissioners authorize advertisement for and contact of a public hearing prior to expending $100,000 or more for transportation planning and engineering services for Cobb Parkway at McCollum Parkway. Can Drew, do less hold on one moment because we have some ch chatter. Sorry, you may proceed. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, for planning and engineering services for Cobb Parkway at McCollum Parkway realignment, project number B2541, and further authorize the issuance of a request for proposals to secure required services. Commissioner Gambrell? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Thank you. And our final item tonight is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve a contract with Chatfield Contracting Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $420,358 for drainage system repairs on Brookcrest Drive, project number D2837. Authorize the corresponding budget transactions and further authorize the chairwoman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Richardson. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Now moving on to our public services regular tab, and we have with us um, our director, Mike Brantley. Good evening, Chairwoman, Commissioners, uh, Madam County Manager. Our item tonight is for the Board of Commissioners to approve a consolidated contract with Atlas Technical Consultants, LLC, for program management services for the 2022 Cobb Park Splice Program and the continuation of the 2016 and 2011 Cobb Parks Splice Program. Atlas Technical Consultants, formerly Moreland Altabelli, have been the splice program management firm for the previous two splice programs, 2011 and 2016, and have been a great asset in delivering quality renovation and construction projects for Cobb County. Their program management experience, institutional knowledge, and understanding of our Cobb County processes make them a wonderful addition to the Cobb Park Splice Program. We ask the Board of Commissioners to approve a consolidated contract with Atlas Technical Consultants, LLC, an authorized work authorization number one from July 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2023 in an amount not to exceed $1,789,868 for program management services 
for the 2022 Cobb Park Splash Program and the continuation of the 2016-2011 Cobb Sparks Parks Splash Program, authorize corresponding budget transactions, and further authorize the chairwoman to execute the necessary documents. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Thank, Thank you. you. Now move on to our next tab for support services. We have with us um, Director Stalka. Good evening, uh, Good evening. Madam Chairwoman, Commissioners, and County Manager. Property management has one item this evening. It is for the supplemental agreement number one in the amount of $4,736,378 for the contract with Batson Cook Company to establish the guaranteed maximum price of $5,460,358 for phase one of the new Precinct 6 station, a 2016 SPLOSH program X1041. Property manager would Excuse me, property management will request the Board of Commissioners approve supplemental agreement number one and authorize the use of undesignated contingency funds in the amount of $536,977.98 and authorize the corresponding transactions and further authorize the chairwoman to sign any necessary documents. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Burrow. Thank you. Okay. So I do have some questions for the county attorney on this one from discussions yesterday at work session. So um, the Precinct 6 is a 2016 SPLOS project. Yes, ma'am. We have design, we've broken ground, and with the materials and costs going up, we're a little over 500,000 short yes, to start construction. We are. So um, a month ago when we approved the $4 million contingency, I guess it was about a month ago, um, my understanding that that was designated for capital or um, improvements or, or projects roads, buildings, what have you, yes, um, that we could come back and ask for. So when um, Sharon approached me that this was over based on the bids and all, um, a recommendation coming from staff right. to use uh, the money out of that four million contingency so I know we cannot my question legally is I know we cannot take SPLOS money and put it in the general fund but we can take general fund money towards a project like this that's a current SPLOS project correct yes, so what is the issue with doing it this way okay well there was by one person, but I'm just trying to get to an explanation of why we're doing it this way and that this is really the only way we can cover the, the um, overage. Is there another avenue that can be used or should be used? Commissioner, uh, as we discussed during uh, a work session, this is the best avenue to get to where you want to you want to be. Um, the staff did share that as a result of cost and product, supply chain issues or whatever, we we just don't have the the funds that were projected and are budgeted two years ago when the SPLOS was actually 2016 SPLOS. So when you think about all of the years that have passed, you are correct. This is one of one of the final few projects that we have left in that particular SPLOS. Prices have just skyrocketed. skyrocketed. Yeah. So with regard to how do you get to, to where you want to be, there are only a couple of avenues, and this is the best avenue to bridge the gap uh, or the delta for this project to move forward. The, it, legally, there is no issue. Okay. 
And, um, but I do, did want to clarify that because the, the $4 million is coming from all of us and staff. So I don't want to um, appear that I'm trying to hog it all, but because uh, I have had one other project come for, through for that, but I just wanted to be mindful of my fellow board members that the reason I'm asking for this. The other 16 SPLOST that is over is way over <laughs> due to cost and material, and it's, I guess, a bigger project. Um, but we're not, we're not asking for that. This is more um, feasible as far as the 500 over. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks well, for your help. Thank you, you ma'am. I move that we approve item number 34. Second for discussion. All right, discussion. Yes, um, so certainly I, I, I think I would agree that this is the most appropriate uses, use of this bucket. It's what it's intended for. But one thing I think we should do moving forward, considering that there are requests that have come from other, this is general comment here, but multiple requests from commissioners, I think it's important that we have some type of policy, procedural policy in place um, that details out the same way that we do the budget process, almost like how do we want to assign the capital, the undesignated capital budget like this, so that we can have those things expressed amongst ourselves and along with staff in partnership, considering it is a bucket of funds. So I, I I'm extending kind of an open invitation with, with our with my fellow commissioners that I would like to see us move in that direction. Um, but I did have some questions for Chief Van Hooser on this project. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners and chairwoman, Dr. McMorris. Yes, ma'am. Good, ma Good evening, and certainly. There, there's just a spotlight on this because there's an overage and we know that it's due to costs going up. But I did just want to understand, and perhaps you can also share to Commissioner Burrell, but the intended use, the purpose for Precinct 6 for this project. Well, we've had that. Uh, it's been somewhat malleable in the past few months with other issues that have been going on with uh, the votes in May and so forth because it was a possibility we would need it for uh, a precinct, precinct four, uh, but there was also some use we could utilize for our special units who now take space that is leased, mm -hmm. uh, particularly not fond of that situation and would like a permanent home for some of those units if, if possible for several, several reasons. Um, they also have some equipment that we can store there. I think under this proposal, uh, we would complete a shell and have uh, some community space, which of course is always helpful, but also maybe some room in the back for us to store equipment until we purposed it specifically based on what happens in the future with some of the things that we've just passed. I hope that wasn't too ambiguous. Um, so it's, it would either be purposed as a special operations building or a precinct if necessary. Okay, thank you. So we've certainly identified some needs I'm sorry. We've certainly me. identified some potential needs. Yes, ma'am. Yes, mm -hmm. we could use it uh, based on what happens with those two situations. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. My Thank only you. question for you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. If I may. Um, that discussion has been ongoing since it was put on the SPLOS list. Um, and in, until it could be with the manpower officers needed to fully man it as a full-fledged precinct, it will house special ops, special okay. units. Thank you. Um, but that, that was one of the reasons that it was delayed from the 16 SPLOST, because we, it, we didn't have the manpower to operate it as a full-fledged precinct. And we didn't know what was gonna happen, you know, with precinct four. But over the years, um, just to kind of give you um, an idea, and Stuart, you may 
want to correct me if I'm wrong, but Precinct 4 on Lower Roswell Road covers your district, it covers my district, all the way over to the, the east side of Canton Road, all the way over, and all the way up to 92 and Sandy Plains and over to Canton Road. Um, a, about three or four years ago, maybe, um, Precinct 4 also expanded south um, towards Delk Road and Powers Ferry down almost to Cumberland to help out Precinct 3. So I, I don't have, I've never had a precinct in my district, so, um, and that area that serviced from Precinct 4 is quite a distance. And that's why I always was trying to get a precinct, and we got it on the SPLOS for 16. Um, so it's, it's very important to me to have it there because it services an area that doesn't have physically located um, officers. Okay. And so we've considered kind of, you mentioned the short term and the long term view there is an operation an idea for an operational plan at some point it, one day it'll be a full-fledged precinct mm -hmm. okay hopefully <laughs> that concludes my questions like i said i did want to just make sure because it is coming out it would be a share it's a shared bucket and so i want to make sure we're all considering things that come out of a shared bucket right well I, I don't know if anyone else has proposed any other projects. I, I haven't seen anybody else's. I just right. was not in the agenda. In discussion with the staff and the county manager, um, yeah. brought those forward. And I know this has been an ongoing discussion because in the SPAS program, there are buckets that are general to address items that could, you know, pertain to matters in each district. And so, you know, you talk about policy. I can't tell you I have an answer, but there is opportunity, certainly, to make sure that each um, commissioner or each district has opportunity to um, have projects funded. Yeah. Are there any additional questions regarding this item or comments? Commissioner Gambrell? As I said in work session yesterday, this is not against not supporting our public safety, but I cannot support this agenda item because it starts setting precedents to, again, transfer money from the general fund into SPLOS projects uh, that the potential of reimbursing the general fund uh, will not be there because collections have ended. I think this sets a bad precedence. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments with respect to that? Um, I just for clarification, is this the first time you've used general fund money to augment SPLOS? You talk about precedent. Or is there? No, no, it's been used on a number of different occasions to Commissioner uh, Gambrell's point, though. Um, oftentimes, if the, in this instance, the collections have ended. Mm -hmm. And so we're saying there's no more contributions or funds that will be added to it. Mm -hmm. On other occasions, when the general fund has been used, it's been during the, during the Tendency of the continuation of the SPLOS, yes. so additional funds, a wrap could be in, in there at the end of the, yeah. at that time. And I think that's the nuance with us being at the end of the SPLOS and just the increased cost of doing everything right now. And sure. so hoping that this will not be a regular occurrence because we you know, do budget conservatively for SPLOS and typically have you know, revenue above projections. Okay, so Commissioner Sheffield. Commissioner um, Burrell, just for clarification, your ask for this project is coming out of the $4 million that um, the contingency that the commissioners can use, um, right, for their discretionary to, to, to meet a need within their district. So that's where this ask is coming out of that bucket. Right. Okay. Okay. And we also talked about um, reimbursing SPLOST. But we can't do that until we get to that point, to the overage amount, correct? 
or we can't it have to come back to the board for well, well not in this one because it's 2016 and, and those 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 have already been expended expended yes mm -hmm. Just to cycle back, I think this is why where we do, we might want to certainly have a policy in place. I mean, I, I've been on the fence because I've like I don't know if we pull it, put a policy in, and then come back and visit. But just having a policy around making sure we're not going to put ourselves in a position to Gambrel's point um, of expanding that our, our undesignated contingency because we become accustomed to the SPLOS having overages. I'm not saying that's a situation and I'm not saying um, it's just anytime we find ourselves, if, if we say ourselves, well, we hope we don't do this multiple times, that means that usually there probably should be a policy in place because it's it means that there is a certain amount of discretion that is um, not preferred. Okay. So. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second. I'll call the question. The motion passes 4 1 with Commissioner Gambrell in opposition. Thank you. Next, we're moving on to our Department of Public Safety, regular tab, and we are going to hear from our police chief. Good evening again. Good evening. Um, Police Department is requesting authorization for the advertisement and issuance of a request for proposals for a new RMS system for the Police Department and for the Sheriff's Office. Our current system is about 16 years old, and as you know, with advancements in technology, there's a lot uh, more opportunity now to do much better and more effective work through a new RMS system. We are recommending that the Board of Commissioners authorize the advertisement for and issuance of a request for proposal for new RMS system for the police department and the sheriff's office. Okay, so moved as presented. Second. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we are now going to our finance regular tab. Go ahead, Bill. Good evening. Uh, finance has one item today, and we are asking the Board of Commissioners to authorize the acceptance of the second tranche of federal funding in the amount of $73,824,239 available to local governments under the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, authorize the corresponding budget transactions, and further authorize the chairwoman to execute the necessary documents. So moved as presented. Second. Is there any discussion? Commissioner Burrell? Um, of the 140 million, this is the second part. Yes, that is correct. And we still have the majority of the first 74 million that we haven't spent. Is, is this for the applications that are coming yeah. in? Yes, yes ma'am. That's correct. The whole 147, with the exception of the 10% contingency that was set aside and any items that the board previously approved for emergency funding would be available through the application process that we currently have open. Okay. Um, I did approve, I did agree to approving the first 74 million, but we haven't even touched on that. So why, are, and the mon this money is already in the fund. Yes, the money was received in our bank account and on June 9th. And as you remember, we contracted with Deloitte, our consultant, to provide a funding uh, investment strategy, the, the major buckets in which the applications will be scored. And that was, again, for the full allocation. In 2021, in the spring of 2021, we received the first 73. This is the second 73 to go along with that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? I'll call the question. The motion passes 3-2 with Commissioners Burrell and Gamble in opposition. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Bill. We're now moving on to our second public comment. Thank you, Chairwoman. The first public speaker is Matt Stegall.
All right, thank you everyone for uh, allowing me to speak tonight. And tonight I'm gonna talk about complete streets. Um, really it's sustainable transportation uh, that's safe for everyone. Um, there are a lot of benefits to sustainable transportation. Uh, number one, uh, this is something that I always say to everyone, it benefits everyone whether they use it or not. Um, it, long story short, it takes cars off the roads if people are able to bike, walk, or take transit instead. Uh, number two, it's more equitable. Um, we all know the increase in the cost of housing. Uh, there's also been a significant increase in the cost of transportation over the last few years. And, um, you know, for uh, people with low incomes, it's very difficult to make the, make the balance books check out um, when you're having to pay for increased costs of both housing and transportation. Um, so it allows more people to get around and access jobs, education, health care, parks, um, you know, the, the myriad of uses that they would want to travel around. Um, number three, it's safer. Um, you're giving more people a chance to uh, take that transportation in safe ways. Um, people are going to bike or walk. We all know whether there's a crosswalk going across the street or not, they're still going to cross the street. Um, people are going to take the shortest distance from one way to the other in the most convenient way. So it's up to um, the county and, you know, and, and the Department of Transportation to make sure that they have the safest way to get from point A to point B. And then the last one um, is, is economic development. Um, it's no secret that uh, more walkable, bikeable, intermodal type areas um, in, you know, sh show that there's support for more jobs and more housing and uh, just more development in those areas. Um, so back in 2009, there was a complete streets policy that was adopted. And in that, this is straight from the, uh, from the, um, from the, uh, from the item. Um, you, you can see there that the complete street concept includes motorists, bicyclists, pedestrians, and transit users. Uh, and there's also call outs for physical disabilities and senior citizens. Um, as, as the county, um, the age of the county uh, winds up increasing over the course of the next couple of years and decades, um, we are going to have uh, more and more of the population that will be dependent on non-car travel. And so it's very important, that was even called out back in 2009. Um, so, so the truth, so that, that was a policy set in 2009. Uh, this was a quote uh, by Brent Tadarian. He's a uh, kind of an urban planner, and he goes, the truth about a county's aspirations, he says cities, I replace with counties, but the truth about a county's aspirations isn't found in its vision, it's found in its budget. Uh, and so if we look at the, um, you know, just what we've done uh, in, the, in our past, uh, next slide, sorry. So in the past, we prioritize our roads, uh, both in the planning and in our funding. Um, this is whether you look at the general fund, if you look in SPLOST, uh, you know, no matter what, we have built this county around cars. Uh, I know there's some blowback to try to start developing the county around other types of tra uh, transportation, but it's needed for us to grow and it's needed for us to attract uh, future residents and workers of this county. They want other ways to get around other than driving alone in their cars. Um, so there's opportunities to um, prioritize or at least look at bicycle and peds in both the planning as well as in uh, funding as well. All right. So where are we today after prioritizing cars? Well, there's high congestion. Uh, that map is from the uh, conference transportation plan. That's of that's the service level for today. 2040. There's a lot more red. Um, car dependent. Uh, over 85% of people uh, go to and from their work in a car, whether it's driving alone or in a, um, air carpooling. And um, it's unsafe. So as we see, um, even with the, you know, people say, well, I don't see anyone biking or I don't see, you know, anyone walking, um, deaths over the last few years have increased, deaths and serious injuries. Um, we are seeing more and more people use, uh, you know, sustainable transportation and it's unsafe for them in a lot of areas, but they're still, I mean, people are still going to take those. Uh, modes of travel, all right? Um, so is the answer to build more roads? Uh, that seems like the simple answer, like just another lane. Well, that's not actually the right thing to do. Um, there's this concept of induced demand. Uh, I've got the graph over to the left. It's pretty complicated. I'm not gonna try to get into it, but my best example for it is Chick-fil-A. You see those Chick-fil-A drive throughs they go from one drive through to three drive throughs and yet the line gets longer. Why? Because more people go through it. And you see the same impact when it comes to roads and, and uh, highways and, uh, and streets like that. So one more lane doesn't always fix our con congestion. Reducing car travel is the only sustainable option. All right, so how do we do that? Local trips and regional commuting. Local trips, that's the combination with land use, and you've got bike lanes last mile. That comes from HB 170. And then you've got regional commuting, that's more of the transit area, and that's HB 930. 
And they're my recommendations. I think we Shire staff is focused on that. And y'all have a great night. <laughs> the next uh, public speaker is uh, Ms. Dyer. Commissioners, Chairwoman, Chairperson, I show up tonight as a general um, su supporter of sustainable transportation. I've learned a lot tonight about Cobb County. And at first I was uh, concerned. Can you hear me? Provide uh, your name for the record. Oh, I'm Natasha Dyer. I Thank live you. in Austell. You don't have to tell us where you live, but just okay. name. Yeah. Um, yeah. And at first I was uh, kind of, I thought, like, am I in my right lane? I don't know too many of the issues going on in Cobb County. Um, but I'm learning now tonight, but I realize just showing up as a general supporter is just general support and transportation should be sustainable anywhere. And so just with that note, um, knowing that Cobb County is supposed to grow by 300,000 um, more residents in the next 20 years to top us out at over a million, and the comprehensive um, transportation plan hasn't uh, kind of looked at anything at, like sustainable solutions to actually get us to reduce our carbon emissions. It's just kind of a general statement on what we should be more looking at. So sustainable transport encourages less reliance on cars and increased use of environmentally friendly travel modes such as public transport, walking, and cycling. Where this is not possible, sustainable transport planning encourages using passenger cars as efficiently as possible through carpooling and car sharing schemes widely promoted by any municipality or county that then gives some kind of reward to the participants. Now why else is this important? Other than just playing an important role in enhancing the quality of life by lessening the assured new congestion of added cars on our roads in a couple of de decades, like why else is this important? So um, social, health, and well-being. When a society invests in reliable mass transit for all of its community members, you're saying that providing them with easy access to critical services like jobs, health care, school, and other life advancing opportunities is important to you. Their well-being and prospering is important to you. Then the environmental aspect. Public transportation um, and less cars on the road helps metropolitan areas meet national ambient air quality standards by reducing overall vehicle emissions and the pollutants that create smog. So when a society invests in reliable mass transit for all of its community members, you're saying that you want them to breathe well. <laughs> so more environmental investments in public transportation facilitates compact development, conserving land and decreasing travel demand, and reduces the need for constructing more roads, which means less runoff for impervious um, surfaces. When we have all those big storms that we have in Georgia, we have lots of big storms. Um, and we don't want all the what's flowing off of the per impervious surfaces to go into our waterways. Also, you get more people off the road, you reduce fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions, those emissions that are trapping heat and warming our planet. Economical. People can also spend much less on commuting. According to AAA, owning and maintaining a vehicle costs an average of about $10,000 a year. Um, uh, but for an, as an example, cities with uh, bigger large uh, transit, uh, people that take transit can spend about $100 a month and actually spend about $1,500 a year on transit. And so um, my recommendation um, is that a sustainability study be carried out that shows what we are planning to do as a, a county to meet sustainability goals in the future. This should be a priority that we should be moving on now. Increased drivers arriving and a climate that keeps on heating up are asking you to act now. Please do something today. The next public speaker is Craig Harford. My name is Craig Harfoot, and um, geez, where to start? Hey, the Bank of America you keep referring to is the Austell Corporation. I saw it in the agenda back there. Who the heck owns the Austell Corporation? Because that's who you're going to sue, not Bank of America. And on this Lower Roswell Road project, safety, in the, in the drawings that Drew showed was the bike lanes are between the left turn lane and the straight lane. And it puts the biker between cars on either side of them. And um, the thing about this wasn't about the condemnation. It's the fact that um, 4811 Lower Roswell Road Corp, no, it's LLC, basically was the old blockbuster. Now it's Papa John's corporate store. It's the emergency dental 
and the new Bagel 101. Apparently, the Weinkoffs owned that. Did a little digging. But um, talked to the owners, but the, I never talked to the franchisee of Bagel 101. He, apparently, he's a foreign speaker like the Nepalese lady. He don't know what's going to hit him. And so in the last year, these two tenants just build out these places for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And now, if you go ahead and go outside the curb line, you're going to move a 250 KVLA power lines, push them off into there. So you're going to take out 14 of their parking places, and then the business is not sustainable. Now, whose fault is it? It's all secret. Nobody can see who's buying it because DOT says it's so we don't have to pay too much for the property. But in this thing, you got two new businesses going to pay taxes, and you're going to kill them. And, you know, you're not aware of any of this because you depend on county staff. And I just saw these plans, and I'll tell you, I got hit turning left into Kroger by a guy turning left out of Kroger. Yeah, you, there's two lanes there. You don't need that. But um, you don't need to be turning left out of Kroger. But they did not address Davidson Road. The, the geometry of that road is screwed up. And if it came straight across into the parking lot, it would benefit the trucks coming into Kroger at the light. It would benefit uh, people coming out or in. So you don't have to, you could turn it a light left on Lower Roswell. The plan is not very good at all. You need, you know, I know you went ahead with condemnation, but you surely got to read a look at this plan. And I'll tell you about the bikes. You know, there was a manager where I worked at Buckhead Life, and he was started riding his bike in Buckhead. And unfortunately, he got mushed by a driver. And he was in Grady for months. He's got titanium all in. He's lucky he's alive. But um, he bankrupted, you know, your health care plan for 1,000 employees. When you have an event like that, it's gone. Then, then they, Grady had to eat it for him being there so long. He didn't have the money. And I'm, nobody carries that kind of insurance to cover it on your car. So, I mean, they talk about an impact for a death is like a million dollars. I'm going to tell you, if it's not a death and an injury, it's more than that. It's way more. And uh, a young girl, uh, this goes to the whole scenario about the precinct and the fire station right there at Precinct 4. Um, there was a heart attack at Home Depot. The fire department responds. The little girl crossed the street and got killed by a car. And that was down where they did the improvement, you know, from... Um, but um, then a house caught on fire. The house burned down because all the staff was out doing all the other stuff. And um, I'll tell you, there's just, I watched, you know, this precinct in the bid. You're spending over a million dollars for these studies and these DOT people, the Arcadis and um, Gresham and Associates, you spent a million and a half dollars doing this plan and it's not a good plan. And you already bought some right away, but somehow in this process, you're injuring new businesses that just came Mr. Mr. Harfoot, sorry, time's up. Okay, but Chair, I hope Chairwoman, you there's to uh, you. no there's additional speakers. Chair, Chairwoman, there's no additional speakers for the second portion of the, the public comment. Thank you. We are now at our appointments tab. And our first matter is item number 37. Um, I'll turn to you, Commissioner Sheffield. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to announce the appointment of Deidre Willis to the Board of Zoning Appeals, and Deidre will replace Jacqueline McSwain. And I'd just like to thank Jacqueline for her service to the BZA. Thank you, Commissioner. Our next matter is item 38. It's um, a matter that has to be voted on by all commissioners, and it is a BOC appointment. However, um, considering that the 
Redevelopment Authority is wholly within your district. Um, like to defer to you for sure. the motions for both this item and our next agenda item. Sure, thank you. I'd like to make a motion to approve the appointment of Jason Gaines to the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority. Jason will replace Daryl Watkins, who have served on the board since 2016. All right. Um, I'll second that. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And for item number 39, I'd like to make a motion to approve the appointment of Sam Col Samuel Culbreth III to the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority, and Sam will replace Herschel Tolson, who has served on the board no. since 2011. That's my good. Thank, yeah, it's been a long time for both, it has. Um, but I appreciate their good. service to, to the board and to the community. Very good. All right. I'll second that. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. There was a question if your appointees are here this evening. Okay. Thank you. With that, we are on to the commissioner's public address. And we have some presentations pulling up. Commissioner Gamble, you can get started whenever you're ready. Thank you. It's beginning to get, be that time of year again. It's the book bag palooza. As families prepare for the new school year, your support can help ensure students have the school supplies needed to have a fun, fulfilling, and successful school year ahead. Cobb County Police Department are collecting school supplies and book bags for children in need. For more information on the items needed, please contact Sergeant Bullis at 404-245. 6771. And as we continue our celebrations of our Senior Services 50th anniversary on at West Cobb Senior Center on Monday, July 11th from 1130 to 1230, you can join us for a cookout and some friendly competition. There will not be a dunk tank, but there'll be other fun. Uh, this fundraiser is to benefit the West Cobb Senior Center. Tickets must be purchased in person at the center. And for more information, you can visit www.cobbseniors.org or call 770-528-8200. Effective July 1st of 2022, there will be a change on the process for conducting VIN verifications. If your vehicle is drivable, please respond to your nearest precinct location Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. for a VIN verification. If the vehicle is not drivable, Cobb County residents must call 770-499-3911, this is the non-emergency number, and request an officer to respond to their location for a VIN verification. This verification process applies to everyone. A 2-22B form certifies that a law enforcement officer has inspected the vehicle's identification number. This inspection ensures that the vehicle has not been reported stolen and that the affixed vehicle number matches the title bill of sale. The T-22B form is provided on the QR code and at the Georgia Department of Revenue website. Stay cool, stay hydrated, and stay informed. Heat exhaustion can lead to heat strokes and summer temperatures can quickly turn a car into a dangerous hot box. If you must run errands, please leave your pets at home and also remember your children. And lastly, happy 4th of July. Cobb County government offices will be closed Monday, July 4th to allow time off for the Independence Day weekend. We hope you and your family have a fun and safe celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Richardson. Okie dokie, happy 4th of July again. <laughs> we'll just start off with that. Uh, we can go to the next one. Certainly find ways to celebrate and uh, there'll be lots of activities going on, I know from, from now until next week, so. 
from the office. D2Cov.com gets an update. So if you haven't been to the site, you won't notice the differences, but if you've visited any time before, you'll, you'll see there were some style changes. We've also added some more content. Um, so brand new look, a lot more important information for our district. I learn about ongoing projects, D2 accomplishments, and office initiatives. Um, there are also other cool additions, such as a link to submit a new idea. Make sure to check all of this out at d2cov.com, just for you. Acts of Kindness, yes, last Saturday we hosted our June Acts of Kindness. Uh, this month's topic focused on safety. Um, in line with this topic, the event was a women's self-defense class led by ACT Women's Self-Defense, which is owned by my veterans cabinet member, uh, cabinet chair, Dan Heydrich. 31 participants joined, including daughters, mothers, and grandmothers. After the class, participants stayed behind to have a discussion on safety issues they noticed in our community and possible legislation that could address these concerns. Some issues included the importance of gun safety education and responsible gun ownership. These sessions help me see what concerns our community so that I can turn that over into drafting policy. So please sign up to attend Acts of Kindness so that you can enjoy an activity and then have a deep discussion. From the community, steam cleanup opportunity. Help clean Sewell Mill Creek and keep litter from reaching the Chattahoochee River. Join Cobb Water System on t at 10 a.m. Uh, 10 a.m. to noon, Saturday, July 9th, for this great service opportunity in partnership with Friends of East Cobb Park. Meeting spot is East Cobb Park, 3322 Roswell Road, Marietta. All equipment needed will be provided. Wear clothes that can get wet and register at the QR code. An emergency financial assistance for 55 and older. Are you 55 years or older and need emergency financial assistance due to delinquent utility, utility disconnection, delinquent rent, or facing eviction? You may be eligible to receive limited financial assistance. Visit cobseniors.org for details and eligibility. Senior Services is not a provider of the Cobb County Emergency Rental Assistance Program. And that concludes all of my updates. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Burrell. Thank you. Well, last week we said goodbye to two great officers, uh, retiring Lieutenant Lester Maddox with 27 years of service to the Cobb PD and his faithful dog, Coda served eight years. We will miss them both and thank them for their many years of service. Uh, tomorrow night, please come out to the Mountain View Community Center at 630 and meet our new police chief. We also have two new deputies that will be introduced and uh, command staff will be there and we've had some changes with promotions and um, we'd, we'd like to uh, introduce our new police chief and, and other officers uh, that will be on hand to answer your questions and get to know them. Um, the Comp Veterans Memorial is one step closer to becoming a reality. The Cobb Veterans Memorial Foundation Board of Directors invites everyone to the Cobb Veterans Memorial Park groundbreaking at 10 a.m. on Friday, July 7th at 502 Fairground Street in Marietta. The park plans a future 142-foot star tower monument and honor walls listing the names of veterans from each of the country's military branches. It will also have a plaza for events, two reflection pools, and a service hub providing information to veterans and their families. Construction is expected to be completed in 2024. And you can visit their website at cobbveteransmemorial.com. And the fishing rodeos are coming back in July. Um, there's four scheduled, Hyde Farm on July 9th, Lost Mountain Park on July 16th, Ebenezer Downs Park on July 23rd, and Fur Family Park on July 30th. 
That's always a fun event. And um, tomorrow night is my community meeting to meet the police chief. And Thursday night um, in my district, the chairwoman will be hosting a town hall meeting at the Tim D. Lee Senior Center. And she'll probably talk more about those. <laughs> um, and the, the meetings are from 6.30 to 8. We've had another adoption, number 219, from our Superior Pets for Patriotic Vets program, free pet adoptions from the Cobb County Animal Shelter for veterans. Um, and this tabby cat was adopted last weekend by Ms. Bowman, who served two years in the U.S. Army. We'll, we are grateful for her years of service and for giving a loving home to this little kit. And I hope everyone has a safe and happy 4th of July and observance um, of our country. Uh, the offices will be closed on Monday the 4th, and you can look for all of us in the parade. Thank and you. And our contact information. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner Sheffield. Mm -hmm. Join me, our parks director and project designer, as we host our first of several community town halls for the long-awaited Milford Osborne Recreation Center. The meeting will take place tomorrow, June 29th at 6.30 p.m. at Jim Miller Park, located at 2245 Callaway Road in Marietta. The town hall will present an opportunity for the community to share their input on the design and recreational amenities at the new community center. I hope to see you there. WorkSource Cobb offers a variety of training programs, workshops, and on-site recruitment for numerous companies. Courier Express will partner with WorkSource Cobb on June 30th from 10 a.m. to noon at 463 Commerce Park Drive in Marietta. The company is currently hiring for truck drivers, warehouse positions, and much more. Mac One Security Services, Inc. Will, will conduct interviews at the same location on July 11th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. The company is looking to fill its armed and unarmed security officer positions. For more information, please visit atlworks.org. Mark your calendar for our annual career fair and tenant forum. Join me, Cobb Works, and Goodwill as we partner with Amazon, the Atlanta Braves, the Marriott Hotels, UPS, Wellstar Health Systems, and many others for employment opportunities. Chief Magistrate Judge Brendan Murphy and his team will be in attendance to discuss tenants' rights. The Marietta Housing Authority and nonprofit agencies will be on site to answer tenant-related questions. The event will be held on July 30th from 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at the Cobb County Public Safety Police Training Academy located at 2435 East West Connector in Austell. Employers will conduct on-site interviews, so please be prepared with your resumes and interview attire. Cobb County is currently accepting applications to apply for grants through the federal government's ARPA program. The federal government allocated $147 million to Cobb County as part of its program. Individuals may also submit applications for project ideas for the, for the county to consider. The application deadline is September 9th, 2022. For more information, visit cobbcounty.org slash ARPA. And finally, we'd like to wish you a happy 4th of July as we celebrate Independence Day. Let us not forget our, our brave heroes who fought for our nation's independence and freedom. Have a happy and safe holiday weekend. Thank you, Commissioner. You guys have made my presentations much shorter tonight, so certainly appreciate it. As Commissioner Burrell said, I'll be continuing to go around the county and listening to our residents about how we can move forward together and look forward to being in District 3 this Thursday. You can go to the next slide. 
want to congratulate Commissioner Sheffield, as I recently learned that she is on a leadership committee in the National Association of County Officials to address um, economic um, development, particularly dealing with equity and economic development nationwide. And so I just want to thank you for your serving on um, a NACO board, but also serving in such a way that you'd be elevated to this opportunity. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so uh, there is a hotline for those in crisis who may be contemplating suicide that has had a pretty long number. Um, if you've ever advised anyone to call or have looked at that number yourself, there will be a new phone number 988, which will go live nationally July 16th, 2022. And just wanted to share that with you. Certainly, I'm hoping that none here will need to use that resource, but I'm grateful to know that we do have this resource and it will be easier to access. Okay, we heard about this event. We can go to the next slide. We can go to the next slide. I certainly want to wish everyone a happy fourth. Hope you have an enjoyable time with friends and family. And I believe it's our coming together and, and being able to enjoy each other that is the strength of our nation. Also want to share another holiday on July 6th. My husband and I will be celebrating 20 years of marriage. So I will not be here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. We did it. And um, I may not be in next week. I may not be at the groundbreaking because our anniversary is the day before, but that's another special event for the Cupid family. Yeah, but with that, I pray everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you for those who live in our county or support our county and stay to the bitter end tonight. Always appreciate um, your presence and certainly hearing from you about issues that are important to you. That have a good evening. <laughs>